is Andy Agafangelo, and the founder of the Transparency Task Force. Um, in a few minutes' time, we're going to be um, inviting each of you to briefly introduce yourselves. And I say briefly only because there is so much to go through this evening that we need to be as succinct as we can. Um, a couple of you don't know much about the TTF, so I will briefly explain that we are a collaborative campaigning community dedicated to reform the financial services sector. Our mission is to promote ongoing reform of the financial sector so that it serves society better. And our vision is to build a highly respected, and for me, those two words are very, very important, a highly respected international institution dedicated to caring for the consumer's interests when interacting with the financial services sector. We think there is a huge need for this around the world. And I say around the world because last year we took the TTF message. I personally ran meetings in Dublin, Amsterdam, Zurich, Brussels, Hong Kong, Singapore, Sydney, Melbourne, Washington DC, Boston and New York. And the net result is we have about a thousand people around the world who are members of our community on top of the 1,600 who are UK based. And frankly, all the signs are showing that we're going to continue to grow very, very quickly. Um, being very blunt about it, we are struggling to cope with the level of interest in our broad range of activities as things are. Um, but we are doing the best we can with very, very limited resources. Personally, I think the single biggest thing, the single best thing that we do is bringing people together to talk about particular topics. And of course, that is what we're going to be doing tonight. I'm going to spend a, a couple of moments talking about the book that we recently published for a specific reason, which will become very clear. So let me go to my book page. And... Here it is, almost there, almost there, almost there, almost there. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. The, the reason for mentioning the book is because we are going to start shortly to prepare the 2021 edition, next year's edition of the book. Now, the book is called Why We Must Rebuild Trustworthiness and Confidence in Financial Services and How You Can Do It. And the book is um, a collection of thought leadership essays from a range of people. I'll circulate a link in the chat to this web page, so don't worry about the detail, but do please take the time to read uh, the executive summary at some stage. The bit I really want to draw your attention to is right around down at the bottom. So these are the contributors. The book is structured around 12 main topics. Um, one of them is transparency, part one. There's a bit about protecting the consumer from harm, which I'll come to in a minute. So the second bit is about leadership. Third is about comms. Um, fourth is about product design, risk management. Sixth is technology. Part seven, protecting consumers from harm. So as you can see, we had contributions for this year's book from Adrian Tuck, who's a Brit, Tommy Burns, who's a Brit, Stefan, who's an American, Paul Bates, a Canadian, Shan Turnbull, an Australian, Nicholas Morris, a Brit living in Australia, Paul Resnick, an Australian, and Sue Flood, who is a UK paint and scan victim. The reason I mention this, folks, is because some of you really do have wonderful expertise around this topic of making sure that the consumer is not exposed to dodgy adverts in plain English. Therefore, there are several people on this session who would be very worthy contributors to the thought leadership piece in the book for next year. So very simply, if that might be of interest to you, then please put a note into the chat to tell me so, and we'll make sure we have a more detailed conversation about that, <clears throat> uh, because it would be great to uh, have you there. Uh, just to complete this page, uh, you can see we've also got a section on financial stability, reward, culture, uh, governance, and purposefulness. Um, and those 12 topics are what we call the finance development goals. Uh, long story short, this is the equivalent of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, but instead of focusing on planetary reform, it's just focusing on reform of the financial system itself. I commend the book to you. So that's the book and the invitation for you to participate as an author, as a contributing author in next year's book. 
we're going to go to intros next, um, particularly those of you who have speaking slots later on, um, please do um, keep your introductions as short and sweet as you can. But basically, who are you? What do you do? Where are you? Uh, I think you're all in the UK for that, yeah? And uh, that, that's all we need to know. So, Mark, Tabor, could you please start off? Thank you. You're on mute, Mark. You're still on mute, Mark. There we go. That's OK. You must have muted. Sorry. OK, Mark Tabor. I'm um, yeah, originally a chartered accountant. So um, last 10 years, I've done a lot of consumer finance campaigning. Um, the last year or so, I've become particularly interested in the issue of, um, I suppose, scams or investment frauds and how financial promotions um, are involved in them. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my background. Perfect. And I can tell everybody that Mark has been a wonderful contributor to um, some of the consultation responses we've completed recently, uh, particularly around the topic which we're discussing tonight. Mark's expertise on this topic is, is frankly outstanding. Thank you, Mark, for being with us. Uh, let's now go to Brian Redbone. Brian, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, evening, everybody. Uh, Brian Rabbon, Head of uh, Technical Services at Transac. I've just literally passed the, my 37th anniversary in the life and pensions financial services industry. Been at Transac for 20 plus years, uh, where I head up a team of uh, 13 people providing tax, technical tax support to advisors and to the business. Thank you, Brian. Great that you're here with us. Uh, Mr. Mark Hambling, please say hello. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mark Hambling. I am a retired uh, accountant by trade. I've done about five or six years with Price Waterhouse um, in insolvency. Um, I am a victim of Dolphin Trust and also the founder, one of the founder members of the uh, GPG Creditors Association, which we set up to uh, basically fight the corner for on behalf of UK loan note holders. We are a small part of the overall debt of the overall picture um, and that basically we are well I'm very pleased to join this campaign because clearly we need some serious support from uh, both people outside the regulator authorities and people inside them if we're going to get any success um, I don't know if I'm going to have a slot later to discuss this in more detail mm. Yes, you, you do have Mark. So that's uh, that's that's great for now. Really, really pleased that you are here, and thank you again to Mark Bishop for introducing us to you, Mark. It's good that you're here. We now go to Francisca, all the way I think in Austria still. Francisca, yes. Austria. Yeah, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Well, I am retired, um, and I am not a victim of a scam exactly. I'm discovering more what it was. I was a victim of financial mis-selling. But what I have noticed since is the regularity I receive invites, which are very similar. And I recently, I mean, I've recently seen some from the company that that was my, my problem. But I also just the other day saw something else and they were going, I just go through it now. I just talk to them and everything else. And they're going through the same drama. You know, they tell me the same things. We're on the FDA, but we're not, we're not, uh, and, and so on. And there's a complete lack of transparency. They give different names from their real companies. It really annoys me, the lack of transparency that's going on here as well. And that they're allowed to market themselves through Facebook and all these other places. Thank you very much, Francisco. It's great that you're here with us. And you actually raised an interesting point, the difference between gross mis-selling and scamming. And uh, the conclusion we come to is that um, any, any product that's being made available with very high commissions is likely to be a, a, a fraud by intent because the chances of somebody getting a good outcome, even if all else is hunky-dory, if it contains very high commissions, particularly hidden commissions, it really is uh, as, as close to being a scam as, as it needs to be. Thanks, Francisco. Let's go to Mr. Peter O'Donnell. Hi, Peter. You're on mute, Peter. You're still uh, hi, guys. Uh, yeah, Peter O'Donnell, 71-year-old, uh, uh, unretired Australian, living in the UK for 30 years. My background is uh, running uh, large IT 
consultancies and re IT recruitment companies. Uh, I was scammed uh, by a pair of chartered accountants in Leicester who are part of a bigger scam called Vavasur in New York. Uh, I ended up losing my house, uh, uh, but it got me into the industry. So that's why I, I've joined. I specialize, I have, uh, I'm a chairman, director and owner of three companies involved in uh, helping people get their money back and, and going after directors of, my dog's here, going after directors of FCA regulated companies in insolvency. Thanks, Peter. Thank you very much for being here. And like others on this session, people have been making a huge contribution to our consultation responses of late. Great to hear, Peter. Thank you. Let's go to Armin. Hello to see. Nice to see you again, Armin. Please say hello. Thank you. I'm a retired PricewaterhouseCoopers tax partner and mm -hmm. member of the policy team at the UK Shareholders Association although I'm taking part in Transparency Task Force entirely personally. I've not been the victim of a scam, but I am acutely aware of how much goes on. Thank you very much indeed. Let's go to Diane. Nice to see you, Diane. Thank you. Please introduce yourself. You're on mute as well, Diane. Please unmute. There we go. Hello, I'm the owner director of a small uh, financial planning practice in Cheltenham. Um, we have about nine people, we're chartered and uh, accredited. Um, and uh, uh, I'm just interested in this. We've come across people who've been scammed before. Um, and obviously I have a sort of uh, feeling that whenever things go wrong, uh, it seems to be the good people who pick up the tab, which is slightly, um, uh, discerning. Exactly. Yes, indeed. Disturbing. I, I have frequent conversations with financial planners and wealth managers about rising FSCS levies, etc. Oh. We've lost you, Andy. We've lost you, Andy. Yeah. Can hear you now. Okay. I was just inviting Maysan to please introduce himself. Thank you, Maysan. Hi, um, my name is Mason. I'm founder and CEO of Elefinti, which is a fintech for good in the UK. Uh, we're looking to help institutions become better uh, at serving the, the customers and trying to improve financial well-being for the consumers at large. Um, I also sit on a charity. I'm a trustee for Toynbee Hall, uh, which is a East London charity for fighting poverty. So very much trying to give back to society. I've spent 15 years in banking as well. My last role was with JP Morgan as head of change. So happy to be here and happy yep. to talk to all of you. Thanks. Thank you, Mason. Great to have you with us. Alex Varley Winter, hello. Hello. Um, yeah, I've been doing a blog for Transparency Task Force every week and I have 10 years in journalism behind me um, and I'm working on various freelance projects. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Edward, I don't think you've introduced yourself yet, have you? No. I have not introduced myself. It's my first time uh, at a transparency um, event. Um, I think um, Alex or one of your, um, Andy or one of your colleagues contacted me out of the blue um, yeah. some time ago. Um, I have to say, when I was first contacted, I wondered if you were some kind of scam outfit. And it's just <laughs> to go. Um, I have been a financial services regulatory lawyer uh, for about 30 years, uh, typically representing the good guys, people who are not in the business of scamming people, um, helping to keep them out of trouble, to keep them complying um, with um, what are now FCA requirements, but I've been helping people comply with them since it was the, uh, the SFA and the F SA bef uh, after that and before the FCA. Um, but I've, I've always been intrigued by the, the possibilities um, that somebody with my experience of keeping people the right side, um, the contribution that I could make, <laughs> help people who are the victims of people who are doing it wrong. Mm. So when I was contacted, uh, you know, I thought it'd be interesting to uh, participate in an event when an opportunity presented itself. I've been helping people right compliant financial promotions uh, you know since 1990 so, you know i certainly know the difference between what 
what you're supposed to say and what you're not supposed to say and what, uh, what signals a scam um, and what signals somebody who knows what they're doing. Fantastic. I had a look at your um, LinkedIn profile earlier, Edward, and you definitely are somebody that I'm sure could make a contribution to the work that we have underway. So please do get, in, get us involved with what we're up to as, as you wish. Mm -hmm. Sue Lewis, please say hello to everybody, Sue. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Sue Lewis. Despite the background, I am in the UK at the moment. So I was once a Treasury civil servant. Um, now I mainly do charity boards, sit on a few advisory things. On the way, I became a sort of specialist in consumers and financial services. So one of my jobs was chairing the financial services consumer panel. Um, and FinProms are obviously an issue for us there. And one of the things that was quite interesting was the relationship with the Advertising Standards Authority and how things could sometimes fall through the cracks or just, you know, the join up wasn't necessarily all that, um, all that good. I've never been scammed because I haven't got any money. There you go. But I'm sorry to those who have because it must be awful. It certainly is. Thank you, Sue. And I'm um, pleased to tell everybody that Sue is part of the Transparency Task Force Advisory Group. So she gives us very good counsel from time to time on various matters. Great to have you with us, Sue. Let's now go to Mark Bishop, then we'll go to Monica and Madalena. Uh, Mark, to you, please. Hi, so my name is Mark Bishop. I'm in the UK. Um, I was one of about 2,000 victims of the Cornwall Income Fund Series 1. Uh, I'm the kind of de facto leader of the action group and of the liquidators committee. I spent eight and a half years now, not just trying to unwind that particular one and kind of persuade a, a reluctant regulator to take it seriously, uh, but I've also spent time more recently uh, trying to understand shortcomings in the regulatory environment and helping people who run other action groups uh, kind of based on what I've picked up over the years. Thank you very much, Mark. And Mark's been making a huge contribution to TTF in recent months. Uh, really has been. We're now going to go to Monica and I hope Madalena as well. We're particularly pleased that Monica and Madalena are with us because, uh, well, for reasons it will become obvious when Monica introduces herself. Monica, over to you, please. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Just very briefly. So my background is of marketing communications within financial services. So I've worked for the big banks, some of the big banks and um, life and pension providers. Um, I, I, I wasn't really aware of scams, to be honest, in this respect, because I've always worked in very highly regulated environments where everything that we produced was very rigorous, vigorously um, looked at by compliance and technical, etc. So I guess this is a new world for me because, um, yeah, I mean, there's no way where I've worked that we would have been able to send anything out which was considered okay. not, you know, in any way misleading. So it's, it's um, unfortunately, it's hard. You know, it's horrible to learn that people are being scammed. Yep, yep. And your current role, Monica? So my current role is freelance. So I'm doing freelance work, running campaigns for people, just really virtual marketing communications. So if um, helping run a social media campaign on a freelance basis, just finished that for the Net Zero Festival, which was run last week for Business Green. So, yeah, just providing freelance work and support where I can in the marketing communications not thank trying to do a but there you go you did ask me <laughs> hello thank you very much and i i invite monica and everybody else to put their contact details into the chat because some of you will want to connect with each other just before we go to madalena let's go to ian ian please do say hello thank you hi yeah i'm i think a correct phrase is probably semi-retired you know this summer i finished about 36 years in primarily the life insurance industry i i'm an actuary most of that period has been product development and marketing. Um, both, I'm based in Ireland, so both domestically in Ireland, but also within Aviva and within Zurich, I had fairly global roles. So I, I, I see the problems that occur in the UK and Ireland or even Europe are, are not unique. And we see them in multiple territories around the world with similar themes coming in. A bit like Diane, I've, I've been there at the end where, you know, as, as hopefully one of the good guys, you know, we end up picking up all the pieces when our, our industry or our products are to an extent destroyed by the scam artists. And, and, and probably as bad, the people who are doing stuff unconsciously and don't necessarily, you know, so there's people doing stuff deliberately and the people doing stuff less deliberately, but both potentially cause equal harm. 
and definitely I've, I've been talking to Andy now for about a year getting more actively involved in trying to help but I think I, I definitely wear a different hat of having seen what can go wrong within the companies and, and particularly for some of the the smaller companies and when you look at some cross-border issues you can see how it all goes badly wrong quite quickly and you can see how it's been very difficult to make it right again. Thank you Ian, great to have you with us. Uh, Madalena, could you please unmute and introduce yourself as well? Thank you so much, thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm a Treasury official so I'm here as the person who is going to be responsible for processing the responses to the consultation on financial promotions um, and I'm very much here in the listening mode. I work more broadly on fraud as well. Um, so uh, very much aware of some of the issues that people have been talking about. Thank you very much indeed. And it's really great, Madalena, that you've decided to be with us this evening. It's wonderful when we have uh, an opportunity to engage with the authorities. Obviously that does include HM Treasury. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, we will of course be submitting a response to your consultation. We think your consultation is incredibly important uh, for lots of reasons. One of them being the old idea that you know prevention is better than uh, is better than cure. So this is the um, consultation that we are um, responding to and dealing with. Uh, you can see it on your screen in front of you here. So TTF will be responding to that consultation. We haven't got very long. Um, we've already got lots of um, content, but it needs finishing off. So I invite everybody on the call right now, uh, apart from, of course, Madalena, because it wouldn't make sense, to volunteer to be part of TTF's consultation response squad for this particular consultation. It's incredibly important. Prevention really is much, much better than cure. If we can stop people from seeing dodgy, illegitimate, misleading, fraudulent, scammy adverts in the bloody first place, then far fewer people will be scammed. So let's do all we can to help this consultation be a great success. And to make that happen, let's feed in the wonderful insights, ideas and information that many of you have got to, uh, to make sure we put in a very valuable and hopefully what turns out to be a very useful consultation for GMT. Um, I'm gonna very quickly show you this page. This is the page on our website where we have previous consultations. We've done quite a few. This is actually not all of them. Um, we, there are various ones we haven't actually got around to putting on the website yet, but we have got quite a slick process in terms of how to put the consultation response together. And we are often told by regulators, etc., that they like the fact that we are simply not, we are not simply representing one particular point of view. We're not coming at things from the point of view of this part of the industry or that part of the industry. TTF stance is purely about representing the interest of the consumer. In fact, whenever there's discussions or disagreements about what should and shouldn't be in the consultation response, we always anchor back to what we call our North Star question, the question that governs everything we do. It guides everything we do. And that question very simply is, what is best for the consumer? So that's the perspective that we have on these matters. Just before I pass over to Mark Tabor, our first speaker for this evening, who I know you're all going to be, you'll, you will all find to be remarkably well informed, I'm going to invite Matthew Vincent to very briefly introduce himself as he's just arrived and it'd be nice for Matthew to say hello. Matthew, please say hello. Hello and um, thank you very much for um, letting me um, uh, join you uh, this evening. I'm the Financial Times uh, regulation correspondent um, and so I take a very close interest in uh, the consultation uh, papers and processes that the regulator um, engages in and, and uh, I'm obviously very interested in the responses to them. So I, I, I'm here to observe and um, I'm happy for this to be treated as off the record or on the record, whichever you prefer. Thank you, Matthew. As a matter of kind of principle, we never do Chatham House. So please, everyone, feel free to say what you want, but it, think of it as talking to the public at large. Uh, there's a saying these days that because of social media, everybody is a journalist. Uh, I guess to some point it's, it's true. The session is being recorded. We might use snippets of it here and there. Uh, so if, if you say something you wish you hadn't, don't worry. Just pop my colleague Alexandra an email and just say to her, please make sure that that bit isn't reported or that bit isn't, isn't covered. Alexandra is going to facilitate that by putting her email address into the chat shortly. Okay, I think we've set the scene really nicely. Um, 
let's not fall into the trap of going through the motions here. The simple, harsh reality is I've had dozens of conversations with people over the last few years who've been in tears, suicidal, semi-suicidal because they've lost their entire life savings. It's particularly tragic. It's particularly tragic when it's older people who are too old to have any chance in hell of making up the financial cushions they built for themselves approaching retirement. This is a topic that's absolutely paramount in terms of TTF's work. And frankly, as far as I'm concerned, the financial services sector in the UK has allowed a festering sore to form in its face, manifest in scams, pension scams and others. Let's do what we can to try to treat that sore. And a constructive step is to make sure we put in a really good consultation response to HMT. And part of that, of course, is going to be the insight, intelligence, information and frankly, wisdom of some of our speakers tonight. Uh, Mark Tabor has impressed me uh, no end with his knowledge and insight on various things. But above all else, what he's been doing on a purely voluntary basis, himself as an individual, to point out to the regulators, the scammy adverts that are out there. It's really impressive what Mark's been doing. So Mark Tabor, please over to you. Um, please all make sure that you're in the right view. You want to be in what's called speaker view. Uh, you're in the wrong view if at the top right of your screen you see the word gallery because that means you're in gallery view. You'll see everybody in little pictures rather than having a, a main speaker view. Mark Tabor, over to you, sir. Thank you very, very much indeed. You've got about 10 minutes plus five minutes Q&A. Uh, if you need to run over a little bit, that's fine, but not too much more than that. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Mark. Okay, right, so here goes. Um, just a little bit of background first on this. Um, I've been looking at the area of financial promotions pretty full on for the last 12 months. I'm so sorry, Mark, I accidentally muted you. Forgive me, please. Uh, Thank you very much. Carry on, Mark. Thank you. OK, so when I, when I got involved, I opened up some existing channels and some new ones as well um, with the FCA, and I managed to get through to Google as well. Um, I had some correspondence with Andrew Bailey at the FCA before he left, and he set up a meeting with his team at the FCA who deal with this issue, who, before the COVID outbreak broke out, I met at FCA headquarters. And I also had a meeting with... Google's heads of enforcement and policy who are over from the US, um, which sort of set me on this merry path I'm now on. Um, of interest to Madalena, I'm, I've actually prepared a submission to the consultation and I'm going to run through that pretty much um, as the basis of what I'm going to say. Um, anyone is welcome to a copy of it, just let me know and I'll, you know, send you a copy. Um, so... I think to start with, financial promotions or the financial promotions regime is absolutely key as a gateway control to prevent consumer harm from either misdescribed products or scam products or investments. Um, you can do all you want after the event, but then you've got victims. Um, the gateway is there with the financial promotion regime to prevent there being victims in the first place. And if you have a robust regime backed up by strong regulation and enforcement, you will not get so many problems. And this was something that Google actually said to me, because these were lawyers from the States who are over saying, look, we don't have these problems in the US. Um, and it was an interesting observation they made. And we ran through some of the differences between the US system and the UK system, which are probably at the heart of a lot of the issues we're now seeing. Um, so I just, I'll run through where I see the weaknesses in the existing system in the UK. Um, I would say it's very archaic and out of date and not fit for purpose in the modern world. Um, I'd break the issues down between regulatory issues, transparency issues, exemption issues, enforcement issues. Um, just briefly, the, the situation in the UK is that a financial promotion issued by an unauthorised firm must be approved by an authorised firm. Um, that's what it comes down to. Now, it doesn't, the laws don't say much more than that, and there's a few exemptions around it as well that are exploited a lot. Um, from a regulatory sense, that presents a number of issues. One of the ones is the one the Treasury are consulting on, um, is that 
there's no qualification or standard to be able to approve financial promotions. Any FCA authorised firm can do so. Um, and I'm just going to illustrate this with a little example. Um, after a recent appearance on Moneybox with Paul Lewis, um, I was contacted by a victim of a scam who was an elderly lady with dementia and a dependent disabled daughter. Um, she had found a savings product um, or looked for a savings products online um, and been contacted by a firm who was selling an investment um, that they were describing as a safe product. Um, they sent her letters confirming that the financial promotion she'd been given had been approved by an FCA authorised firm and also from a barrister um, giving regulatory compliance approval of the scheme, um, a leading barrister who actually happens to be from Geoffrey Cox's chambers at the time that he was the Attorney General. Now, when I saw these two letters that she sent me, I thought, well, these are fake. I then proceeded to check them out. Um, it turned out the barrister had approved the scheme. He says he approves a large number of similar schemes each year. I looked into them and most of them were frauds. I then looked into the guy who's the FCA authorised person who had approved the financial promotion. And this was an investment memorandum, you know, a full document describing the promotion. Um, it turned out he was really FCA authorised and he had really approved the promotion. But he had the lowest FCA permissions you could have. All he had FCA permission to do was to was debt counselling. He had no more, and he actually had passported in FCA permissions from some previous regime. And apparently under the regulations, he was able to approve financial promotions. Um, and there was key things in this, just to show how bad this is. And the financial promotion she has sent had descriptions of the board or the executive committee of this company that she was going to invest in. And it had two people who headed it up. They were both described as chartered surveyors. This was a property investment business with lots of years of experience, having done billion pound developments all over the world. When I looked at, and this had been approved by two people, a barrister and an FCA authorised person. It took me five minutes to establish that this was all false. One of the people who one of the people turned out to be a landscape gardener from Essex who had no qualifications whatsoever. The other person doesn't even exist. And it absolutely shocked me to the core when I discovered that. And that's what really happened. And it happens time and time again. And nothing is done about these people. So there's a core problem there in terms of who is allowed to approve financial promotions. Um, it goes a lot further than that because the FCA not only don't know who's approved financial promotions with no standards over it, they don't know which financial promotions have been approved and they don't know where withdrawal of financial promotions has, been, has, has happened. So you can get a situation, for example, where a financial promotion has been approved and this is a common trick in scams. The, company, the, the, the rogue FCA authorised person who approves it is paid £50,000 to approve the promotion. A day after he approves it, he withdraws his approval. But the approval is still used. The letter he gave and his name is still used on the financial promotions by the scammers. And when it comes to the end of the day and people go back to him and say, well, you approve this. He said, oh, but I, I found out there were problems with Drew and withdrew my approval the next day but no one can find out. The FCA can't find out, consumers can't find out, no one can find out what's happened. There is no record anywhere of, of what investments have been approved, what investments are gonna be promoted to the public or anything like that. So there's an enormous problem there. You know, and that moves on to the transparency issues is that if you're a consumer and you're given a financial promotion, you can't find out if that's genuinely been approved by an FCA authorised firm. Because another trick is, you know, they will say it's been approved by an FCA authorised firm and name the firm, but it may not have been. And you've got no way of verifying whether it has or not. Um, and again, as I said earlier, you can't verify whether the approval's been, been um, withdrawn or not. Um, there's also in the transparency side, a big confusion for consumers. And I've discovered this a lot with victims I've spoken to. 
they conflate the fact that an, a, a financial promotion for an investment has been approved by an FCA authorised firm with thinking that the investment itself is a regulated product or investment. And that is an enormous area of confusion. I understand where it comes from. And even journalists I've spoken to would be confused over this issue. Um, so so, that, so that's, a, that's, an, that's another problem. Actually, just coming back on the regulated area, and this is a, a slight hole in the Treasury's promote, um, consultation on this, is that um, the approval process, if you're an, already an FSA authorised firm, you're allowed to issue your own financial promotions without them being approved elsewhere. And of course, the famous one here is London Capital and Finance. They had FCA authorization, so they were able to issue their own financial promotions without any independent scrutiny whatsoever. And there's another loophole that gets used is that you can, and this has happened in Bassett in Gold, another scam that's blown up, is that a firm is able to have an FCA authorized subsidiary that approves its promotions. And that happens as well. So you've got two examples where, you know, there needs something needs to be done about firms approving their own promotions or having a subsidiary company that approves them for them. Um, that's another issue. So just looking at what else we could do. So there's no way that consumers can check anything at the moment. There's no register. The Reds FCA has no register of what investments have been um, approved or their promotions have been approved and are going to be marketed to consumers. Um, is another huge problem. Just running on. Um, another problem here is the exemption issues. Um, there's two key exemptions. One is the famous Google one, I call it. Um, as I discovered from my correspondence with Andrew Bailey, um, there's a huge problem in that online platforms operating in the UK but based outside of the UK but within the European Economic Area are exempt from being treated as publishers of financial promotions. Hence they are not jointly liable in the way that traditional media like newspapers are for what they publish and so they do no vetting whatsoever of the promotions they publish and you know more and more people look for opportunities, investment savings, pensions, products online now and they are being caught by fake um, comparison sites um, which only exist to fish your details to try and sell you um, either bad faith or scam investments. Um, so that's one hole that needs to be closed so that um, you know the online world is regulated and you know in the financial promotions in the same way that traditional media is because at the moment it's completely unregulated and I'm sorry to say it, Google are not going to volunteer to do this unless, unless made to. Um, the other exemption is the famous sophisticated investor, high net worth individual one, which is abused beyond belief. Um, a lot, this allows unregulated firms to promote unregulated investments to people who have said or you know, supposedly that they're either high net worth or sophisticated. Um, the definitions there actually capture a huge amount of vulnerable consumers. You know, you have lots of vulnerable people who have money um, who get targeted. And to be honest, people, the FCA have admitted it, people get groomed through the process. The, um, the exemption is put in a small print and victims are only made to sign a certificate of it at the last minute after the sale's being done and it's explained as an inconsequential um inconsequential bit of admin they have to do so again that exemption is another one that enables people to you know rogues to slip through you know the um the framework that's there as it is um we're going to run out of time here so I'll quickly whiz on to enforcement issues now as you know, the, it is a credit. The, the FCA is the regulator and law enforcement agency for our financial promotions regime, um, and it is a criminal offence to issue or for an unauthorised person to issue a financial promotion that hasn't been approved by an FCA authorised firm. Now, I've reported 450 to the FCA so far this year, and I haven't seen one any bit of evidence of a single prosecution being made. Um, the last 
two two years FCA annual enforcement reports reveal that there have been no prosecutions in the open financial promotions regime. In the latest 2019-2020 report that was published last week, the FCA had mysteriously removed the line item for financial promotion, so they're no longer even disclosing what's going on, which, considering what a hot potato is at the moment, is the most abhorrent you know, lack of transparency you can imagine. You know, to me, I'm saying, well, I'm, I'm going to use freedom of information to try and find out because I've reported 450, so I want to know what they're doing about it. Um, so you've got the criminal lack of enforcement that goes on. And even more alarming, and the Times have reported on this via a freedom of information request that Mark Bishop actually made, is the FCA haven't taken any action against regulated firms that are approving false and misleading financial promotions. And that, again, is another one. I mean, I can show you 100 firms, 100 examples of financial promotions for fraud or bad faith investments that have been promoted using false or misleading financial promotions, which have resulted in billions of pounds of losses for consumers over the last few years. Probably 50 FCA authorised firms involved. None of those firms have had any formal enforcement action taken against them or have suffered any penalty e either. So there is a lack of action from the regulator against the rogue firms who are causing these problems. And the FCA have actually admitted to me that they have a lot more work to do in dealing with rogue firms. But I think they need to come clean as to why they find it so hard to deal with it. You know, if the BMA were unable to get rid of a doctor who was a danger to patients for 10 years, there'd be absolute outroar. I don't understand why the FCA are not able to deal with a firm that is knowingly approving false and misleading financial statements. I mean, they are, you know, guilty of a crime by association and, and, and it shouldn't be happening. So those are my main points. And I said, in terms of how to fix this, I mean, I think the Treasury consultation has addressed one very small part, which the issue is, you know, who's approving these things and the FCA doesn't really know. Um, but it goes a lot further than that. You know, this needs to be addressed by a thorough review of our financial promotions regime, which, you know, a lot of people have pointed out is 90 years out of date. In the US after the 1920s, when they had a lot of problems with false, you know, claims of fantastic returns on bonds and shares, they brought in a system whereby any investment, and they have a very broad definition of investment, or security they call it in the US under the security laws, must be registered with the regulator along with um, a number of filings about who's behind it, what the business is, audited accounts, before it can be promoted or sold to the public. And that's a big missing link in this country. As I said, no one knows what's going on, not even the regulator know what investments are out there, what's been approved, what's being sold. It needs to be done. I mean, quite, you know, it's, they did it in America 90 years ago for very good reason. The UK needs to do it. And if I was in government, I'd do it tomorrow. Just say, come on, you know, anything you want to promote to the public has to be registered and regulated. You know, you do it with other, anything else that's harm, harmful or could be a danger to the public, whether it's drugs or anything else, you know, it's, it's properly regulated and licensed. Do it with investments. It has to, you know, it's the only way you're going to solve this problem. And that would create... A solution to the bigger problem around scams is that at the moment it's very, very hard to identify where the issues are because I said there's no register of anything. You've got volunteers like me responsible for 50% of the scam warnings the FCA is issuing. And I'm doing it behind the, behind the curve. The FCA take weeks to get a warning out, weeks to tell Google by time, that time the damage is done. And the FCA aren't doing it proactively. No one wants to do it proactively. Everyone's scared of coming up with blacklists because they don't want to be, you know, sued for putting someone on a blacklist when they got it wrong. Yep. Very simple solution. Have a whitelist, make it a legal requirement. Anything you want to promote to the public has to be filed with the regulator with ongoing requirements. If you're not on that, if you're not on that register, it's unlawful. There can be no doubt about it. Pensions, trustees, ISA managers, banks, building societies could refuse to transfer clients' funds to these things if they're not on the list because they're unlawful. 
solves the problem. I mean, it's very simple stuff. It's not rocket science. So that, that's, um, you know, that's most of what I've got to say on the subject for now. Mark, Mark it's Anyone wonderful. <clears throat> it is wonderful hearing you speak about this topic because you're so knowledgeable on it and you make such points that are they're so compelling. Um, I wish, um, I don't know, if I had a magic wand, I'd, I'd whisk you somehow to be in charge of this whole problem. And I'm sure within a within a short period of time, you'd sort the whole bleeding thing out. Um, well, they might, you know, tell the Treasury I'm here. I, any, any time you want to talk to me, I'm there. But in, in all seriousness, Madalena, I urge you to connect with Mark and have a have a conversation. I think you'll find his insight very helpful, very constructive, very professional, very civilised and frankly, extremely knowledgeable. I can see Mark Bishop's got his hand up. I'm going to I'm going to jump the queue. One quick question, Mark. Um, given the fact that it all looks, uh, you know, very porous, you know, a very, very ineffective protective wall around the UK consumer in terms of financial promotions, it, it seems so bad. How can it be? How can it be so bad? You know, institutionally, what is going wrong here? Is the FCA the wrong entity to be doing it? Does, is there nobody in the FCA that feels it's their responsibility to be on top of it? What What do you think is going wrong here? Because clearly something is going wrong. I think the problem is a lot of it is within the law. The financial promotions regime isn't fit for purpose. Um, it doesn't address a lot of the issues. I think the FCA should have been shouting about this for a very long time. I think they're starting to say it now. Now, I had a meeting with them in February where I put this point forward about the fact that they don't know what's going on. No one knows. No one can check what investments exist, what's been what's been approved by an FCA authorised firm and that the US system is far preferable. Now, Andrew Bailey set this meeting up with me with his team and everyone in that room agreed with me. So I don't know whether the FCA is saying this in private to the Treasury or not. It's not a new problem. I mean, the online problem, I had a business advertising on Google 15 years ago. This isn't new. This problem's existed for a long time. London Capital and Finance advertised on Google, or their you know, affiliates did for years and spent 20 million pounds. You know, this stuff's been going on for years. It's not a new problem. It's just people like me shouting about it and exposing it for the last 12 months. Is, you know, and it's getting exposed in the media is starting to make it, you know, more visible. This isn't new. So I I question, you know, I know we've got some from the Treasury here, whether there's a, a disconnect between the Treasury and the FCA in terms of getting this resolved. Um, personally, I think the FCA should have been shouting about it publicly through the Treasury Committee and other channels to help resolve this because, um, you know, I don't know. And, I, and, you know, to be frank, there are problems, as we said, you know, the FCA aren't prosecuting the criminal offences. But then again, a non-executive director of the FCA has told me in private, and I've been had this um, actually in a meeting with the, the team that the FCA and Andrew Bailey set up for me, both said they have legal problems prosecuting the financial promotions offences under FUSMA. So there are clearly problems with the law. Right. I can't answer why the FCA haven't screamed about it earlier. Um, Again, and I can't answer for why the FCA, you know, if you take the enforcement side against regulated firms, I can't answer why they haven't done more on that. I mean, those to me are two glaring issues. So you've got a problem with the way the FCA enforces what's there at the moment. And you also have a problem that what's there at the moment isn't fit for purpose. Mark, thank you very, very much indeed. Let's now go to Mark Bishop. And if anybody else wants to make a point, ask a question, make a comment, then uh, feel free, just, just draw attention to yourself, raise a hand either digitally or in, in, in real world terms. Mark Bishop, over to you, sir. And then we'll go okay, to Frank. So, thank you. Thank you. It seems to me that from what Mark Tobias said, there are three problems here. The first is th the rules are not as they would ideally be. The second is it would appear that the FCA is not push pushing for the changes to the rules that we believe would be necessary to make things better. But the third problem, which perhaps is actually the biggest, is the FCA does not seem to be enforcing the rules that exist at the moment. Now, apropos that, um, I, I go back to what Mark said very early on in his presentation, uh, where he talked about having unpicked a specific um, promotion 
and found in five minutes that it was a, a pile of, of shit, to be honest with you. Um, now, Mark, have you sent your dossier to the FCA and asked them to prosecute the person who approved that promotion? If not, I wonder if you'd be kind enough to do so and keep the pressure on them to prosecute and the reason what or to explain why not the reason why i say that is it may be that most of us on this call have reached the view that the fca is kind of spectacularly unfit for purpose but that view is not widely held uh, in, in the treasury or amongst politicians and we need to get them into that position if we are to change the regulator um, whether that is reform or replacement uh, and, and i kind of think that everything we can do to create a dossier that says here is the evidence that this regulator is unfit for purpose and it's current form is really valuable. Yeah. I mean, just to answer your question to me on that one is, yes, I have. Um, the results were shocking because it turned out, and this was an investigative journalist who's looking at this as well, that the FCA had known about this. It's something that only came to me after I'd been on Moneybox a few weeks, a few months ago. Um, the FCA had known about it from the time the scam started because of the people who were involved. They looked at it at the time and both the barrister and the FCA authorised person who um, were consulted on it were contacted by the FCA at the time. Now, the scam ran its course and afterwards the insolvency service um, wound one of the companies up in the public interest. But the FCA knew what was going on from the start, issued no warnings about any of it and did nothing to protect any of the victims and had taken no action against anyone involved. They may well be now because there's me and journalists sniffing around it, but they had known from the start what was going on. Um, and it is the most shocking thing I have ever seen. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that, that I won't go on now because it's, you know, it, I'll take up too much time. Thank you, Mark Tabor, for your answer. Thank you, Mark Bishop, for your question. Francisca, as succinctly as you can, please, only because I want to keep things more or less to schedule. Francisca, over to you, please. Thank you. OK, I just want to just say a, a small thing I've noticed, a small item. I've noticed a lot of promotions by people who come out with a fancy name, like Expat Financial Solutions, and then that is not the name of the company behind it. And I've come across this about five times now, and I don't think it should be allowed that a company issues something with a fancy name when their real name is something else. Thank you. That, I, I, I think you it's a very good point. Um, and it comes back to a bit of this thing around transparency is at the moment, there's no real way of checking. So a firm can pretend to be someone else and there's not really a very easy way of finding out whether they are or not. Um, which is one of the reasons why I think this whole idea of at the end of the day, they might be a firm, but they're going to have some sort of investment they're going to push on you. And if there was a way you could check whether that investment was lawful and had been lawfully registered together with filings that have been vetted, then you would have a way of doing it. And also, you know, whether you, if you your back transfer money could could do that check um so i, I agree the, the reason this this happens it shouldn't be happening but no one does anything about it and, it and it's very very hard for anyone to check whether they are or not, are not who they say they are thank you mark very very much indeed I, i'm sure everybody feels the way i do that was a very um knowledgeable uh session mark thank you very much in ttf land we have a <laughs> We have a particular way of thanking our speakers. We we wave like six-year-olds. So remember how you used to wave when you were six? You do this, all right? And you, you wobble your head about as well like this. That's how we say thank you to Mark Tabor for his session. Please do. Please do. Ignore the urge not to do it. Just go with it. Go on, go on. Thank you, Mark. Very, very good indeed. Thank you. <laughs> lovely, lovely, lovely. Great stuff. Okay, superb input, Mark Tabor. We go from Mr. Mark Tabor to Peter O'Donnell, who also has massively impressed me with his knowledge. Um, Peter, we are a little bit behind schedule, so I'm going to invite you, sir, to be as succinct as you can be. But I know you've got a lot of very, very helpful stuff to say. You can talk about so many things. Please try to focus on the issue about financial promotions and what needs to be done to sort this this situation out. I nearly said mess then, that, that would be a bit rude, this situation out. Peter O'Donnell, over to you, sir. Thank you. Hi, uh, yes. Um, by the way, the uh, financial promotions, if you 
invest in a product through a FCA regulated financial promotion and the company that promoted it is regulated and goes under, you can't claim from the FSCS. You can only claim if you've got advice from a regulated person in person. Okay, uh, why there is so little confidence and trust in UK financial service promotions? Uh, words matter. A pension scam is actually investment fraud. Regulated financial advisor uh, means a regulated company. There really is no such thing as a regulated advisor that is responsible. Offshore unregulated investments are always scams. Missold, misadvised, it actually means lied and deliberate deception for personal gain, fraud. Okay, I was a victim, uh, so I've got an insight into this, but I'm gonna just talk about a case study. Uh, Black Star Wealth Management, uh, or how to get away with investment fraud in the UK by regulated financial advisors. I'm looking at everything from a regulated advisor. The, this, this, this situation started uh, if you look at the, the, the investment that Mark Hamblings involved, what was lost his money in Dolphin Trust or now German Property Group, I understand 6,000 people invested 1.6 billion pounds and the insolvency practitioner administrator has now said uh, there is no money and there are no records. The, there was a lot of money. The, one of the problems is these people paid 30% uh, of the money invested as commission. And in one particular case, there was a company called Avocade or Avocard, depending on which part of the country you come from. Avocard uh, was an unregulated uh, promoter that uh, obtained through their promotions, 93 million pounds in investments uh, into amongst other things, and particularly uh, Dolphin they were paid 10.2 million pounds in commission. So 12% of the money transferred. So the 18% went to someone else. Now, Avocade not being regulated was prosecuted by the FCA under the FSMA 2000 section 19, uh, being an, uh, an unregulated party promoting regulated products. And they, uh, they were successfully prosecuted and they've been uh, banned from being ever being in financial services, which they didn't want to be anyway. And they have been fined 10.7 million pounds by the FCA. Now, uh, they were represented in court uh, voluntarily by a uh, leading Queen's councillor uh, who, uh, just wanted to get to terms with doing that so he could then uh, prosecute uh, people or, or take action against them. Now, you can't invest money with a pension. This is all pensions investments, pension fraud, investment fraud, unless you go through a regulated company. The main regulated company was a company called Blackstar Wealth Management. Blackstar was run by a guy called Craig Humphreys. And uh, he... Uh, promoted uh, Dolphin and he paid from his cut, I believe, his commission Avocade for their promotions. So this is part of a team of Avocade unregulated, Blackstar Wealth Management regulated. He uh, he was uh, he was not prosecuted but he had 26 claims against his company upheld by the Ombudsman Service. 26 is a lot. Yes. Uh, it takes around two years for the Ombudsman to make a decision on whether to reject or uphold a complaint. Uh, and generally you've got to be pretty smart because this is not, it can be defended very successfully. You've got an individual fighting a company with lawyers. Now uh, I've got lots of information here and I'm happy to, make it available to people. But uh, he sought, uh, he, as soon as he had 26 claims, his professional indemnity insurance failed to pay out and he had no choice but to uh, seek insolvency. Uh, professional indemnity insurance will only cover one or two payouts. Uh, and then they'll say, hang on, this isn't professional negligence. This is a hell of a lot more than that. And they withdraw their, their, their cover. Once covers withdrawn, you can't be a regulated company. 
And therefore, what do you do? Well, you go along to uh, an innocent little insolvency practitioner and say, I I'm misunderstood. I've been, uh, it's part of the claims culture that's uh, uh, prevalent in the UK. I've been forced out of business by these people who I don't owe money to. All the decisions are wrong. And uh, here's 10,000 pounds to go through the process. Uh, will you do this for me? Uh, and the insolvency practitioner in this case was a man called Andrew Fender. This is all public, uh, publicly available. And he has a, a consultancy in Solihull called Sanderlings. I visited him in November last year and uh, uh, with a, an insolvency litigation funder and said, we'd like to take action against the directors. He said, look, let me keep the directors on side for a little while until I uh, can get them on side and then I'll bring you in and let you loose. Um, uh, our first step in doing that, we do an audit of director misfeasance of an FCA regulated company. Uh, he didn't get back to me. And then I noticed that he, he moved the insolvency from uh, insolvency to dissolution. So it was too late, he was gonna close it down. But when he started the insolvency, he sold the client records to one of the employees of Blackstar for 5% of the first year's revenue that she would generate using those clients. She started an FCA regulated company two months before the insolvency started. Uh, so ex-employee started it, uh, no money, uh, and then the insolvency was closed before she even started trading. So uh, you've got a situation which uh, he took all of his money, all of the profits he made, closed the company and it now has two other financial services company that he's operating. There is no punishment for facilitating and recommending to clients that they put their money into a fraud. As long as it's uh, called an unregulated investment and that, that investment primarily is done through a third party. Um, I've got a bit too much stuff here, uh, so I won't, won't go into it. Uh, but essentially, it means that if you're regulated, you can't be touched. The company is liable, not the, not the directors. The insolvency practitioner is under no instructions to take action against the, uh, the directors. Even when it's pointed out to them, fraud was involved, they can dismiss that and simply say you're wrong. And I get a lot of insolvency practitioners who actually defend the, the directors saying they're misunderstood and it wasn't their fault. Uh, I've reported this to the, uh, the regulators of the, in, the insolvency practitioners, two associations, the ICAEW and the IPA. But to do that, you've got to go through a gateway on the insolvency service. No matter what I said about the, what I call misfeasance by the part of the, uh, the insolvency practitioners, they said that what I wrote to them was not sufficient for them to report them to their regulators. So we have this conspiracy of silence that uh, is both institutional uh, and uh, no one wants to recognize the problem. So in summary, people who regulate, who invest through, who, who advise by unregulated investment advisors for regulated products might be happy that the person who recommended the product is uh, bankrupt, but the person who actually facilitated it isn't. And where the money went, in this case, Dolphin property, uh, no action is being taken against the uh, owners and directors of, well, one director, Mr. Smithhurst, of Dolphin property. So uh, it pays to the FCA regulated and commit fraud. Peter, thank you very much indeed. Um, can you just tell us briefly, how did the Dolphin scam, how was it being promoted? Was it being sold through financial planners? What, what, what were they doing to, to Mark, actually- Mark Hambling is much better positioned to talk about this, but yes, it was promoted through unregulated people, such yep. as Avocade and IFAs, because to, to put your pension into one of these products, it has to go through a regulated person. Yeah. Uh, a SIP administrator must be regulated and they're supposed to do due diligence on those investments. But if the IFA lies and says this person's a high net worth uh, investor, 
they don't have to do that due diligence on the investment product. So it's very easy to get away with uh, misleading and not have any action taken against you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much indeed. That's been extremely interesting. And I hope as many of those people get as much of their money back as possible. Let's open up the questions and comments uh, following that session by Peter. Please raise your hand if you have something you'd like to say or, or ask. Mr. Tabor, go for it. Thank you. You'll need yeah. to unmute, Mark. Well, unmute me. I'm, I'm unmuted. Yeah, so actually, I'll just type this in the comments as well. It's a really good point Peter made earlier on that I, um, I meant to raise myself is that at the moment, and it's because um, approving a financial promotion is not a regulated activity, um, there is no route for victims or consumers who've relied on a false or misleading financial promotion to make a complaint or even get any redress from the FCA authorised firm who approved the financial promotion. Um, it, so does that, come, it does come under it does come under the remit of the ombudsman service. Uh, they can they can uh, they can take complaints on uh, promotion, advice, and transaction, but the FSCS can only do it on promotion. They can't accept claims on uh, promotion or transaction. Yeah, you know, the, the the problem is is that the firm the the, the, the consumer is not a client of the firm who approves the promotion. Um, they, they they just approve it for whoever's you know issuing they can the investment. action against they can take um, action. So the FOS won't accept a complaint. Um, so this leaves consumers or victims of um, firms who you know approve false financial promotions with no realistic recourse. And the other thing is, of course, is that it means there's no consequences for the firms who approve the financial promotions in the first place. You, you, can, you can guarantee if it was a regulated activity and consumers had a right to um, complain to the FOS and be awarded compensation against the firm who approved you know, a false promotion, that would give them one hell of a reason not to approve them in the first place. Yeah, it would. Um, but at the moment, with, as I said, with absent any action by the FCA, we don't do anything about these firms, then they just carry on. They take £50,000, approve it, and, and, and so they go on. Uh, does anybody else have a question or comment they'd like to ask before we briefly move on? Yes, Sue Lewis, go for it. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. It's, it's a little bit of a diversion, but it, it suddenly the last speaker suddenly reminded me about this um, thing about high net worth individuals and the idea that just because someone's got a load of dosh, they suddenly become a sophisticated investor. Mm. I, I mean, I did battle with the FCA over this completely fruitlessly, but actually just getting rid of that distinction, which is a job for the treasury, by the way, if you're, if you're still there, treasury, I can't see you. <laughs> um, I think would yeah. help quite a lot. Can I comment on this, please? Please do, Peter. Thank you. We, we, we just did an audit of a, a financial advisor who uh, sold uh, pe uh, share investing, unregulated share investing, uh, uh, to 700 people. And one of the things he had to do was uh, fill in a, get clients to fill in a form, know your customer. And the main part of that form is attitude to risk. And he pre-populated the form saying everyone had a high tolerance to risk and they're accepting that they would that they would invest in in rubbish. And he uh, he then sent those pre-populated forms for them to sign. And if they didn't agree with these, uh, his assessment, then he wouldn't he wouldn't advise them where to put their money. Bloody hell. Bloody hell. Thank you, Peter, for that. And so I think you make a very valid point. Um, the sophisticated investor regime has been abused, exploited. And I think Mark Tabor said in his talk, he said that it's almost treated like a little paperwork formality at the end of the process once the client has emotionally bought into what they're doing. So people know how to get one over the customer. The asymmetry of information between dodgy advisor and innocent 
easy to pull wool over eyes consumer is horrific that's why this is going on uh, does anybody else have anything else following on from peter's session in which case we're going to take a very short break Okay, it's uh, time to reconvene. Uh, our next speaker is Mark Bishop, who I'm extremely grateful to for wonderful support on many fronts over the last few months. Uh, Mr. Mark Bishop, over to you, sir. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Andy, for your extremely generous introduction. I I'm loving my involvement with TTF. It's great to find a bunch of kind of honest people, good guys from the industry, um, other victims of scams, and, and generally people who want to, to help in a constructive way. And uh, with that in mind, I've put together a, a few slides for us. There are only five of them with content on, so it won't take long, but I'm gonna go to share screen. Uh, I hope that this is the right, right way to do it. Uh, can you see, all see my screen? Yes, we can, yep. Okay, so here are my slides. There's an intro slide and my first slide. Okay, so I think it's really important to talk or at least speculate about the context for why we're suddenly seeing you know, a spurt of consultations from the FCA and in this case from the Treasury. Uh, personally, I think that it's because uh, the external reviews into uh, three regulatory failure cases, uh, Connaught, London Capital and Finance and interest rate hedging products, are all due to be published very soon, quite likely next month. And obviously the Connaught and the LCF ones, which involve consumers rather than businesses, and where there are issues about promotions, are the ones we're most interested in. Um, I believe if they're anything uh, close to being truthful, they will both be extremely critical of both the supervision and the enforcement regime of the approval of financial promotions in the UK. Uh, so it might be worth just talking a little bit about what happened about promotions in these two cases. So in Connaught, where, where I'm one of the victims, there were effectively two sets of information memorandums or memoranda. Uh, the first were promoted by Capital Financial Managers Limited, which is now Link, and the second lot by a company called Bluegate Limited, which is pretty much a startup um, up in Manchester. Um, and uh, those were, not third party promotions, because actually uh, these firms were the funds to operators, the first capita, then Bluegate. Uh, in London Capital and Finance, of course, we've got quite a mix because initially the promotions were approved by a third party, namely Sentient Capital. After LCF got approved, it started to uh, promote or uh, use its own promotions. Um, and subsequently, or during this time, of course, uh, it had a marketing agency down in Brighton, which did um, a lot of the Google AdWords and phone-based marketing, email-based marketing. Um, and a lot of people would argue that the, that the materials that it used were also promotions, in which case you're looking at an unauthorised firm issuing promotions. So all three categories of promotion are present in the LCF case. Um, we know that the FCA is positioning these reviews as lessons learned exercises for the FCA, it wants to downplay questions about whether, you know, actually wider society wants to learn lessons and perhaps start asking questions about whether the regulator or the, or the rules are fit for purpose. It's an internal lessons learned exercise as far as they're concerned. Um, and I, I wonder, and it may be I'm a cynic, uh, whether the consultations that are underway this year, some of them, could be attempts to implement very minor changes uh, that suit the regulator before we've seen the reviews. Because of course, once we've seen the reviews, there might be a public debate about some of the issues raised. Whereas if the FCA says, actually, as soon as we saw the draft some months ago, we realized things needed to change. And actually look at all of the things that we've already done, all of these closed consultations. So perhaps I'm being unduly uh, cynical but that's the context in which I tend to see this exercise. Um, and I therefore think we have to respond uh, when we're replying to the consultation, not to the questions that are asked or to the proposals that have been raised, but to the underlying problems. And we have to do so blind without seeing the reviews. So we are at a significant disadvantage. Now, uh, this is an interesting slide in a way because it just talks very briefly about the FCA's uh, proposed solution. Uh, it is really that. Uh, authorised firms will no longer be able to approve promotions for unauthorised ones unless they first obtain FCA consent to conduct this category of activity. That, in essence, is their proposal. And they put forward two options for how the law could be revised to make this possible. And of course, it is technically a Treasury consultation because there is a proposal to change the law. OK, so this is really a quick slide on why I believe that the proposal is inadequate. 
The first is, can we actually be confident that the FCA would be capable of filtering out authorised firms that might be tempted to conduct this type of business negligently or dishonestly? Well, it's a rhetorical question. I think we all know the answer. Um, the proposal does not, on, does not address the problems of unauthorised firms approving their own misleading promotions or promotions being approved by unauthorised firms, both of which are significant, not least we've heard about them from Mark Tabor earlier and, uh, and from Peter. Uh, deterrence and redress problems, which are also important, are ignored entirely. So uh, this is my kind of slide, which is an attempt to understand the problem as it actually exists, the whole problem and not just the little corner of it, kind of not very well resolved by the proposals that are currently being put before us. So it seems to me there are three parts. The first is there are lots of misleading promotions. The second is there is not much deterrent for this activity. And the third is there is a lack of redress for the victims. So looking at misleading promotions, as I've said, really there are um, there are four categories. There are unauthorized there are authorized firms that approve misleading promotions for their own products, authorized firms that do this for third parties, unauthorized firms to approve promotions for their own products, so basically boiler rooms. And there are some unauthorized promotions that are actually or apparently originating outside the UK. They mostly use the exemption that there is for EAA uh, promotions. Uh, there is a lack of deterrent. Now, I will stress that I'm not a lawyer. So if I annoy my compliance person, if I've misunderstood the legislation, I, I very much apologize. But when I look at part seven of FISMA, sorry, the Financial Service Act 2012, which talks about misleading statements and impressions, um, where there is a maximum of seven years sentence. Uh, and I look at the firms that issue or rather approve misleading promotions. I ask myself whether those people have committed that offence and if so, why they're not being prosecuted. Okay. Again, when I look at section 21 of FISMA, uh, which deals with unapproved promotions. So you're issuing or uh, using a promotion that was not approved by a regulated firm. Uh, it seems to me there's a maximum of six months custodial sentence. And I don't see a lot of people being sent to, to jail for doing that. Um, and of course, over and above these issues, the FCA has enforcement powers, such as the removal of permissions and the opportunity to fine firms and individuals. And again, how often does that happen in connection with misleading promotions? I actually carried out a, a couple of, um, what are they called, freedom of information requests on this that uh, were picked up as uh, Mark Tabor said, I think I'm right in saying that uh, in a five year period, uh, there was uh, two or two cases in which individuals were fined for misleading promotions, no firms fined, no individuals or firms uh, were removed from the register, and no individuals or firms uh, were prosecuted. Uh, so not much really happens. Uh, if I were a fraudster, I think I would probably get away with it in this industry in the UK. Uh, there is also the question, again, Mark Tabor hinted to it, uh, referred to it, which is the lack of redress after the fact. Uh, the FCA is very reluctant to use Section 382 restitution powers, and of course, they're only of value if there is money there. Uh, it's very difficult to prove a chain of causation in a civil court, especially when an authorised firm approves a promotion from an unauthorised party. It can say it's acted in good faith. You are not a client, as we've discussed, of the authorised firm, but only of the unauthorised. Uh, there is a limit to professional indemnity insurance in the authorised firms, and there's dissipation of assets in unauthorised, so there very rarely is money to go after. Uh, and of course, the FCA allows firms to be on the register when their asset base is, in fact, you know, very small relative to the type of risk they're taking on. And we've discussed very briefly in passing, there are also problems with the policies of the FSCS, uh, which very rarely will stand behind uh, misleading promotions. Um, so here is my alternative approach. A few slides, or one slide here, you may agree or disagree with these proposed solutions. So uh, the first problem we're trying to deal with is the authorised firms approving their own misleading promotions. Uh, I agree with Mark Tabor, the UK needs an equivalent of the US Securities Act of 1933, which basically says if you want to issue a financial promotion in this country, you lodge it in supporting evidence such as accounts with the regulator, you absolutely stand in full by that document. If that document's misleading, you are civilly liable for it. If it is misleading, you may be prosecuted for it, you will probably personally go to jail. I think the maximum sentence is 20 years. Um, and I think that that is, is pretty tough. Um, and I think it should be backed by something as well uh, if there is a uh, lack of solvency, and that is the FSCS rules should extend to misleading promotions irrespective of the product type. Now, I absolutely understand that there is an argument that FSCS levy 
is actually a kind of a, a bad regulation tax on the honest. And, and I think there's an element of truth to that. But actually, if we go down the route that I'm describing, there will be so few misleading promotions that this will seldom need to be used because rational people would not take the risk of issuing or using uh, misleading promotions. Uh, I also think that there is an impl implication here that we require a duty of care. So this is a firm's towards customers and of the regulator towards the public. We've talked about duty of care. It's something that a number of organizations going back to when just after um, Andrew Bailey joined have been pushing for. The FCA clearly doesn't like this idea. It keeps kicking it into the long grass. Um, and I also think there needs to be a duty of care of the regulator to the public, by which I mean they have a duty to act. And if they don't act, I think that they should be civilly liable for the costs incurred, um, the negative externalities that are caused by this inaction. Um, so that's very much um, pertinent to the consultation we've recently seen about the complaint scheme. Second problem which we need to deal with is the authorised firms approving misleading promotions for third parties. Most of what's above actually will suit this as well. And, and when it comes down to it, in actual fact, if we did the things that are in that first uh, set of bullet points, you will very rarely see a regulated firm approving a promotion for an unapproved third party, because why would they? The stakes are too high. The third thing to deal with is the unauthorised firms, such as boiler rooms, that approve their own promotions. So that promotion has never been anywhere near a regulated firm. So the penalty for doing this needs to be very much more severe than six months maximum prison time, spectacularly so. Uh, we need US-style wire fraud legislation that covers phone, email, online and social media. Perhaps also enhanced investigatory powers, for example, use of covert recording and whistleblower incentives. And I think we also need to fill in the black hole that exists between the FCA and the police. As a lot of you probably know, the FCA says it is not the lead prosecutor of for fraud. And of course, looking at all of the types of fraud that there are in the UK, this is an accurate statement. But the police tend to believe that they are the lead prosecutor of frauds relating to financial services and have a very good reason for that belief, which is when such a fraud is committed, usually there are other criminal offences have been committed relating to financial services, such as misleading promotions or unapproved promotions. Um, and also these are things that require a lot of uh, specialist knowledge and sophistication to investigate, which the FCA is very much best placed to do. So the police are very keen to get rid of these cases and dump them on the FCA. The FCA doesn't really want to do anything with them for reasons we might speculate about. That's why nothing happens. And finally, there is the misleading promotions that are apparently or actually from outside the UK. And the reason why I make this distinction between apparently and actually is that when I've looked at a lot of them, what you'll find is there's a firm incorporated in Ireland or Gibraltar or Malta, but actually the individuals are in the UK. Really, the basis of that fraud was in the UK in most cases. Um, but there is a front that means actually the online promotions order, or whatever it's called, means that they can say, well, actually, we're beyond the FCA. Uh, the Online Harms Act, which is, you know, is currently a bill, but it will come out very soon, could create a duty of care and a liability for the carrier if we act quick. Uh, you could reverse or amend the Financial Promotions Order 2005. You could allow non-UK promotions only from countries where there's a memorandum of understanding between the respective regulators, where there is FSCS or local equivalent cover, and where there is an extradition treaty. So what are the benefits of these proposals that I'm putting forward? Well, the first is that they address all misconduct involving misleading financial promotions, and not just one type, namely authorised firms approving promotions for unauthorised ones. So in that sense, I think it goes a lot further and actually dealing with the problem than do the Treasury proposals, which are really FCA ones. Um, it deals also uh, with issues of deterrence and remedies, which again are totally absent from the current proposal. Uh, my plans avoid problems created by the regulatory perimeter, which is often an excuse for regulatory inaction. Uh, it's media neutral. Uh, these plans recognise the seriousness of the threat from online scammers and deal appropriately with that. Uh, it's also this way of thinking leverages Brexit to evolve UK financial services regulation from the unfit for purpose European model. Now, we've talked a little bit today about um, German Property Group, uh, which is also Dolphin Trust in the UK. Uh, if you look at Barfin, the German regulator, not only did it kind of sit by for six years while Dolphin Trust filed no accounts, uh, but in Wirecard, where it was blatantly obvious that some billion euros or more had disappeared, uh, not only did it not act for months, but it allowed its own staff to short the stock. Absolutely remarkable. You know, these are levels of behaviour that we would expect from the FCA. 
uh, and actually they're going on regularly in bathrooms. So we often think, you know, anything European, particularly anything German, is somehow superior to what we've got. It isn't. In financial regulation, the US is probably the best major regime. We should be aiming to be as good as them. And Brexit may be the opportunity to pivot in that direction. And what I'm proposing is also in tune with the direction of travel of the wider Anglosphere, where there's a trend toward more rigorous consumer protections. If you look at Australia, of course, there was the Royal Commission, where not, while it may not have been perfect, it certainly woke up ASIC. And in New Zealand, you've got things now a lot tougher than they were because they looked at what happened in Australia. And when you look at Canada, you know, those people actually are very good because there's a lot of kind of cross-marketing and so on with the uh, with, uh, US. So they tend to pay for themselves as well. So those are my, my suggestions. You may agree or disagree with them, certainly in, in the questions, which is coming up now. I'll be very interested in any thoughts and any, any um, people asking questions. Uh, I'm now going to try and find a way to go back to, um, to not sharing so we can have gallery view. Yeah. You've done it. You've done it perfectly, Mark. As per your presentation, that was perfect. Thank you very much. Again, we are spoilt with uh, very high quality uh, content and input from our from our speakers. Um, I just heard a ping, and I've got a feeling Mark might have accidentally. Oh, he is there. I thought you might have accidentally ejected yourself from the Zoom. <laughs> Wonderful presentation, Mark. Thank you so much. Uh, please do, folks, raise your hand if you'd like to uh, make a. Point. Uh, Sue Lewis has raised two hands. So has Francisca. So we'll go Sue, then Francisca, then Mark Taylor. Thank you. No, I was just clapping. <laughs> <laughs> it was good, wasn't it? It really was good. It really was good. It was a, a typically kind of forensic analysis of the problem. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, you're absolutely. welcome. Thanks, Sue. Absolutely. If I, if I was a regulator, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd hire Mark Tabor, I'd hire Mark Bishop, I'd hire Peter Don, uh, Donnell, I'd hire Mark Gamblin later on. There's so much knowledge here and input. You know, it, it would be so sensible. It would be such a brilliant use of resource to actually get some of that expertise and perspective in. It really would. We're going to... Uh, sorry, yeah. so, uh, sorry to insert myself there. I just want to say something. You say that partly in jest, but the irony is, ever since 2014, I've been trying to get the FCA to work with me on a change program that would do exactly that. Since then, I've been trying to, in fact, since 2013, I've tried to join the consumer panel. I have tried very much to work with the FCA, but actually it doesn't want to work with me for some reason. I wonder why. We'll leave that one hanging there. We're going to go to Francisca next, and there's a few others have put their hands up as well. Francisca, your comment question, please. Thank you. Well, I just want to say I, I'm in Austria and um, I agree 100% with the final points that uh, Britain should be looking in the direction of the US. I mean, I don't didn't know what the system was in the US, but I'm shocked at what's allowed in Europe. I mean, Britain is so much better, in my opinion, in regulation than Europe. And, you know, the banks charge so much for a customer if you want to invest. They put 5% before you go in. They put, what, 5% a year. And if you exit, they want 5%. You ain't going to make no money on it. The only one who's going to make money on it is the bank. And I think it's just verging on criminal and it wouldn't be allowed in the UK. Thank you very much, Francisca. Armin, over to you, please. Thank you. Yes, I believe very strongly that really serious change needs to be achieved. And the change that we need to achieve is with our 650 members of Parliament. And... Our goal should be both ourselves and with other bodies that would be interested, for example, the Consumers Association, to have a perpetual, continuous lobbying effort. But most of the effort actually needs to be directed at MPs rather than the FCA. You don't complain about the monkey, you complain about the organ grinder. And it, once members of parliament get religion, everything else will follow accordingly. I'd like to comment on that point, because I think I think Amin's right. Um, we, as some of you know, we worked really hard to campaign for the Working Pension Select Committee to open an inquiry on pension scams. And I'd like to think that that inquiry is proving to be really worthwhile. So much very worthwhile evidence is being shared with them. Um, a few years ago, we campaigned to get the Working Pensions Inquiry sorry, the Work and Pensions Select Committee to open an inquiry on the issue of hidden costs and charges in pensions. And again, I'd like to think that that inquiry, which was also open, has proven to be quite worthwhile. Um, I'm coming to the general conclusion 
that the regulators really do listen to politicians. So if we do want change, the idea of engaging with and influencing politicians is a sensible approach. That's why we put so much energy in the, over the last, frankly, two and a half years in getting the all party parliamentary group on pension scams up and running. It, maybe it shouldn't be that way. Maybe it should be possible to not need to get parliamentary involvement to get regulators to listen. But it, it kind of seems that that's what is necessary. That doesn't mean we don't we, we shouldn't be responding to regulators. We absolutely have to respond to regulators. But the real audience of the document we're going to write is yeah. actually not the FCA. The real audience of the document we're going to be writing is the public, its journalists, and its members of parliament. That's really interesting. I mean, I'm so very glad you're on the response squad for it. Thank you very much. Let's uh, let's run with those ideas uh, when we put the document together and let's think about how we can get it in front of various politicians uh, eyes as well. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have any comments, questions before we move on? We've got Ian, then Alex, then Mark Tabor um, and then Diane. Ian, Alex, Mark, Diane. Ian, to you first, sir. Thank you. Yes, it's just well, two, two thoughts. For first one's maybe uh, the most fundamental one. As a non-UK practitioner, yeah. this whole concept of you know intermediaries or authorised firms being able to approve other promotions for cash um, and then not really have any more involvement struck me as quite strange. And you know, at times you go, why, why don't you just ban it? And, and you find there's some you know hidden effect, and you're throwing a baby out of the bathwater, but. Yeah, you know, I almost can't think of any any place where that's likely to lead to a good customer outcome. You know, if you suddenly just banned it, you wouldn't lose anything in that whole process because it does it does feel entirely inappropriate. So I'd be welcome if someone suddenly said we really need it to continue because it will help something here, and, and I just couldn't think of anything, and no, I've no. gone through it for a number a number of days now. The second one I think is related to the EEA stuff, and I, and I think I think you're fair. Different countries seem to have taken a, a substantially different approach to how how aggressive we want to be on promotions coming into them. And I, I think it's a fair call that places like Germany definitely have dropped the ball on multiple things. You know, the UK definitely has maybe not been uh, as active in enforcing rules as some other regulators. And you look, and I must—I've seen some experience of people selling into Italy, you know, out of either Dublin or Luxembourg or places like that. And the Italian regulator in relation to promotions, and particularly promotions from regulated entities, is very activist. You know, it probably goes well beyond what we can legally do according to the directives, but effectively has you know requires companies to engage with them on promotions so they can assist in ensuring they're fair. Now. Technically, I suppose legally, you wouldn't be dragged to court for not engaging, but we'd make your life very, very difficult. So, so again, I think you know, regulators have a lot of tools. You know, it's not we're barred from doing stuff, and, and post Brexit, it becomes very different in the UK anyway. Mm. But it's you know, either it's difficult, it's not deemed to affect a lot of the population, or it's not one of our focuses. But, but yeah. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. We're going. To, thanks. For, thank you very much, Ian. We're going to go to. Um, Alex, then Mark Tabor, then Diane. I'm going to invite everybody to be as succinct as you possibly can because we're a bit behind schedule. So uh, Mark Tabor, as succinctly as possible, please. Thank you. Oh, sorry, it's me, me oh. first. Okay, go, go for it, Alex. Yeah, go for it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say um, I'm, I'm checking that I've understood the, the situation correctly. We think, that, we think that the US system is better. In the US, what they do is they... Um, if anyone wants to promote uh, an investment product, they have to make filings and register it, and it has to be approved. Um, has anyone looked at the cost side of that? Like, how much would how much more would the U would the UK have to invest in its regulatory system for that to be doable here, or are we just looking at the principle behind it? To my knowledge, Alex, I don't think anybody's done the costings on it, but my hunch is it would work out net, net, net. It would work out a hell of a lot cheaper doing it their way than our way. Um, our way is a bit like having gas installers who don't need any qualifications to be gas installers. It's just a matter of time before you get houses that blow up. Uh, and that's kind of what we've got here in the UK. Uh, Mark wants to make a point. Go for it, Mark Bishop. Yeah, in response to what Alex said, um, the honest truth is I don't know. 
Um, it occurs to me that one of the most amazing things that I really like about Transparency Task Force is your network. Uh, and I bet that there are people who work in the States who will be able to answer this question for you. Um, and the third answer I'd say is this, if I were a regulator and we appointed, we had the 1933 Act in the UK, the Securities Act in place here, what I'd actually do when I received a promotion is nothing. I would actually not even open it. And the reason I would not open it is the minute you open it, actually, to some degree, you become liable for checking it. The aim is not, in my view, to check it. The aim is to lodge it somewhere and say, the person who provided this, who is the only person that can use it for promotional purposes, um, is actually saying that they stand or fall by this. If it's misleading, they're civilly liable and they could go to prison. That's what I do with it, personally. So I don't think the cost would be for the regulator. I think there would be cost for regulated firms because I think the cost of issue and the promotion would be much higher because you'd have lawyers crawling all over it. And I've, I've invested in equities in, in the US and I've seen 33 pages worth of you know, qualifications before you actually get into the main body of the IM. And my suspicion is that that's your expensive lawyers at work. Thanks, Mark. Uh, great point, Alex. We should try to find out the answer to that question, cost of the SEC's approach. Let's now go to Mark Tabor, who I know is going to be nice and succinct for us. Thank you, Mark. OK, just because Alex asked the question, there's a little bit of an analogy in the UK at the moment in terms of any listed investment. You have to file a prospectus hmm. that's been approved with the FCA or the UK listing authority that's part of the FCA. So there's, there's something that goes on that's a bit like it already. Um, so I, I, I actually don't think it going you know, compared to the, the savings it would make in terms of problems and FSCS costs and losses to consumers, the costs of doing it would be tiny and I'm sure the regular, the industry would be happy to pay for it. Um, yeah, just so that's one thing, but just skipping on the a good point Mark made was around the regulated perimeter and avoiding problems with it. Um, in terms of sorting out the financial promotions regime, it's no coincidence that. Um, bonds is the instrument of choice of companies issuing what I call bad faith investments or companies with no legitimate purpose. Um, the reason for that is, is that it's a vague area where there's no answers. Um, you know, the FCA, before London Capital and Finance collapsed, said on their website, bonds are regulated by the FCA. No ifs, no buts. I pointed out to Andrew Bailey and it was removed the next week. But, you know, that's the problem. Um, it's a grey area and London Capital and Finance, you know, the FCA have now invented the term mini bonds that they say were unregulated. There's now a judicial review going on over that question because under MIFID 2, any firm that's issuing bonds on a, their own bonds on a professional basis is called. Now, the FCA never decides whether a firm is doing something on a professional basis or not. Um, their guidance, if you read it, you would say London Capital and Finance and the other hundred firms who collapsed were doing it on a professional basis. In my mind, any firm that's issuing bonds on an ongoing basis as their sole form of finance to retail consumers is doing it on a professional basis. Um, and anyone would be entitled to think that. And yet the FSA, of, you know, post-event said, no, they're not. So we have huge confusion around the regulated perimeter and this nonsense needs to be resolved and the financial promotions regime needs to apply to all investments. There can't be this nonsense of is something, is something called or is it not? It should be every investment and it should be a clean tie up of everything. Thank you, Mark, very much indeed. Great points uh, continue to come from you. Thank you. We're now going to go to Diane. Diane, your point, please. Thank you. You're on mute, Diane. There we go. Lovely. One of the slight frustrations and anomalies that I find is the link between the Treasury and the FCA, because it often sees, seems to me that the FCA is actually unaccountable to anybody, even though they're part of the Treasury officially. Um, and if, if anybody, if they do issue any fines, the fines actually go to the Treasury. They don't go to the advice sector or anything like that. The fines go to the Treasury. And this or a strange relationship between the Treasury, which is part of the government, and the FCA is not clear at all. Mm. Um, and, you know, they, they just don't seem to be accountable to anybody. We've got Mark saying that he's actually provided 450 e uh, evidence of 450 
um, misleading promotions and they haven't done anything about it. Thank you, Diane. You've just left a touch paper underneath Mark Bishop. I know he's a, this is a point he's passionate about. Mark, go for it, but please be as succinct as possible. Thank you. Absolutely. I, will, I agree with Diane. If somebody said to me, wave a magic wand, do what you want to the FCA, on day one, I would give it direct reporting to a named minister. The reason is, if there was a risk of a minister losing their job, or perhaps even the government falling, when there was a financial services scandal that a regulator could have, should have prevented, then these things will get the attention that they deserve. Until there's that political accountability, as long as there's plausible deniability, the standard of performance we get from the FCA will remain the norm. Thank you, Mark, for being so succinct. Great stuff. We're now going to very, very quickly move to Mark Hamblin, who's going to be sharing his thoughts. Mark, if I could invite you, please, to somehow squish, 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 squish to about five minutes. That way I know we're going to have time for our just a minute round finishing at eight. But as some of you know, we'll keep the channel open for to 8.30 for any kind of fireside chat, informal, unstructured, lightly facilitated conversation afterwards. But I do want to make sure we do finish on time. So if I can invite Mark Hamblin to be as succinct as possible. Over to you, sir. But just before you do that, let us uh, wave like six-year-olds for Mark Bishop. Let's go for it. Go on, everyone. I know you, I know you secretly want to. <laughs> I know you want to. Thank you very much. OK. Mr. Hambling, over to you, sir. Good stuff. Thank you. <clears throat> right. OK, so um, where do I start? In five minutes, it's difficult to talk about Dolphin, and especially in the context of what this meeting is about tonight. But it, essentially, Dolphin is really uh, will become a textbook case for everything that all of you have been talking about. Um, it involves uh, worldwide failure of regulators particularly in Germany, but also in the UK, uh, and possibly also arguably in the Republic of Ireland as well, where there's a lot of um, a lot of victims. So very quickly, Dolphin is essentially a Ponzi, a, a hybrid sort of Ponzi scheme, where they do just enough so that it doesn't look like a Ponzi scheme, but they always pay people back, or they pay people's interest out of new money. So by that definition, it is a Ponzi scheme. Um, well, what has basically happened through the years is it started off in Ireland, uh, then it moved to the UK, where in fact Blackstar, who've already been mentioned, but one of the parties that actually signed off for promotional stuff. Um, it then moved to over to Singapore as well, to France, to Russia, to Israel, to Japan, to Malaysia, and, and then the final one was uh, South Korea. Who, who chucked in quite a lot of money. Um, and, and the next port of call was Saudi Arabia. They were going to move into Islamic finance, but they never did. Um, but anyway, so it's managed to go for 12 years, which is not bad for the average Ponzi scheme. It involves maybe as many as 25,000 investors around the world. We're not really sure. There are around 6,000 who hold the UK loan note, um, and I'm one of them. Um, there, a lot of those are expats, a lot of them are actually foreigners, but they've got UK loan notes for some reason. There's a couple of thousand in Ireland, four or five thousand in Singapore, so uh, we've no idea how many in, um, in, the, in, the, in South Korea. So it's a massive fraud, uh, we're told by the administrators. There is no money, the accounting records are a complete shambles. This guy has upwards of 300 companies, um, they're not even uh, they're not even subsidiaries, they're all standalone SPVs. So under German law, uh, well, we're hoping that the court will agree that there should be one administrator for all of them. If there isn't, then most of it will never get investigated because if there's no money in a particular company, they'll just get shut down. So um, we are 99% certain that there will be one administrator and uh, we're actually waiting for the court decision tomorrow as it happens, but um, there you go. So uh, in terms of the promotions that were wrong, I mean, clearly this, I mean, one of the problems with the promotions is, is that the company just didn't do what it said it was going to do. You know, it said it was going to put people, it was said it was going to put money, people's money in escrow uh, with a lawyer, with a law firm in Germany. It didn't. It said it would only use our money for buying buildings to, to redevelop. It didn't. Um, you know, it, it just failed on every single level. So, it, it, you know, it's just, it is one of the best orchestrated scams probably ever, I would think, to get away with this. 
Um, some of the some of the facts are, uh, are are not known. We know that commissions, particularly in the Far East, were up to thirty percent. In the UK, is twenty percent as it happens, but um, that's, a, that's a small issue really. Interest rates are extremely high. Uh, on my loan notes, I should receive ninety percent over five years, which is if you get it, it's a good a good return. But I mean. Some of the loan notes were interest bearing. So on one of my loan notes, I received interest every six months and I got that on the nail. So consequently, if as long as the cash keeps flowing in at one end and enough is spat out at the other end, nobody realizes there's a problem. And many people in actual fact have been caught on this and they've been investors for years and they've had their loan notes mature and they've had the money back and then they've reinvested it. I mean, why wouldn't you if you get money back? Why wouldn't you? So. Uh, it's a major, major problem. It's been in the UK, which is what we're concerned about, really, is it's been peddled by regulated firms and it's been peddled by unregulated firms. Uh, many people have been caught out what, through pension reviews, where people have had their pensions pulled together from you know lots of little pensions pulled together into one place and then stick it into Dolphin or something equally bad. Um, there are, we're told, 1,200 ex-service people who've taken their MOD pensions out and, and they, were sold, they were sold into QROPs in Malta so that they could invest in Dolphin. So virtually any way, uh, we, we're told that one of the large pension firms who have to remain nameless, I guess, at the moment has moved people from SIPs to SASs so that they can hold unregulated investments, namely Dolphin. So no other reason for, for them having a SAS other than that's the only way they could have a note. So I know one victim had her money in um, Glasgow, uh, Glaxo's pension scheme, took it out. She was going self-employed when she finished at Glaxo's and, and her IFA, who was regulated, said, oh, well, I think you should put it into a SAS. You know, totally inappropriate. And she put three quarters of it into Dolphin and a quarter of it into something else which hasn't yet fallen over, but probably will. So it's a really, really sad story. Um, and frankly, we, I've joined this group, hopefully, to see if we can do something about it. Um, clearly, we need to get to the regulators and we need to get them to, uh, to assist us. Um, there are many, many firms that they could do something about, um, but this question is whether they will or not. Um, in, in Germany, we're fairly certain that, you know, I've been to the Bundestag last week to meet a politician there who is, um, I think, an ex-leader of one of the political parties there. Uh, so, you know, we're taking it as far as we can in Germany, right up to as far as the Bundestag, because clearly Baffin has been useless. Baffin was into Dolphin two or three times, said, no, nah, nothing to do with us. There's no retail investors. Of course, there are no retail investors in Germany. They're all outside of Germany. Um, uh, the tax office went in there and, in fact, the tax inspector wrote in his report, I think this is a Schneeball, and, in, and that means snowball or Ponzi scheme in German. That's back in 2011. The, lo the local prosecutor has had a file open for the last three years for money laundering, but he hasn't done anything. At the moment, he's got a file open, but he won't talk to anybody. So we don't know what he is doing. So, you know, the Germans are looking very concerned about this uh, I think somebody's already mentioned yes from from Austria you know the European system of regulation at least as far as Germany and maybe Austria goes is, doesn't seem to be very good I think in France it's a lot better in Ireland it's fairly poor uh, what the speaker from Ireland probably doesn't realize is that the largest promoter of dolphin in fact the wholesaler of dolphin is also the largest uh, private pension operator in Ireland has a, has a secondary company which flogs all this crap. So they're into solar farms, wind farms, all that kind of stuff as well. Um, as well as promoting dolphin. Um, Mark, you know, Mark, this is just- so uh, Mark, I'm gonna have to keep, keep it, uh, sort of curtail it there if I may please, but that's been very, very helpful and very, very useful. Uh, we're gonna go straight to the just a minute rounds in a moment. And then, as I said, from 8 till 8.30, we'll keep the channel open for anybody that wants to continue into the far side chat part of the session. But, Mark, thank you very much indeed for sharing your insight with us. And, yes, we most definitely will do all we possibly, possibly can to help you and the your fellow victims with the Dolphin Scheme. It is, it's a disaster and it's an absolute disgrace that so many, frankly, so many regulated advisors were hoodwinked into doing what they 
ended up becoming involved with. Um, once again, please let's wave our, to show our appreciation and support to Mark Hamblin. Thank you very much. And from that, we're going to go straight to Brian Radbone, who's got one minute. We literally are copying, uh, I hope this, there aren't any copyright infringements here. We are copying the Radio 4, just a minute round format. So Mark, Brian Radbone has got up to literally one minute to share with us what he'd really like to share. Um, Brian Radbone, over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, just to reiterate a lot of what's already been said, that the current sort of front end check system we have on promotions is just isn't fit for purpose and doesn't work and nobody seems to want to make it work. Um, so the proposed changes, yeah, OK, they look like they might be good, but the same problem applies. If they're going to be put in place, they've got to be properly policed. They've got to be give people teeth in the right place. Otherwise, we're not we're not going to move forward. Um, and again, something that's been on my mind, this could be all made a lot easier. I don't know why we have this sort of cottage industry approach to investment in the UK. Let's stop that and just say, if it isn't authorised, if it isn't regulated, let's kick it out. Let's keep it safe because the damage shouldn't get done there. So that seemed uh, straightforward enough to me, but I'm a simple fellow and I'm sure people in the investment industry would have a go at me for that. So what has happened, of course, it's all been reactive, hasn't it? And we've heard lots of um, information tonight about how people have been hurt and tried to recover stuff and, and, and how difficult that is. I mean, I'm talking now with my sort of provider hat on a bit. You feel that some of it's getting pushed out towards us now. So in terms of the assets um, you can hold in a SIP, for example, they call them standard or non-standard. And if you want to hold non-standard assets, your capital adequacy requirement. So the FCA, they'll point at the SIP providers and go, right, you've got to put your cap out up if you want to hold these things. Um, now, I'm obviously not talking about scam investments, but the more esoteric ones. Um, and that's caused some people a problem. Um, on the other hand, somebody was just talking about SASs there. We spend a lot of time increasingly over the last year heading off people from because people are trying to transfer away from us to these SASs with these products attached to them. And we're saying, well, hang on, it looks like you're playing the regulatory game here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it's very difficult for us because, of course, it's the client's money. However, we're trustees of a pension scheme, we have obligations. So we find we're doing a lot more policing for the FCA, if you like, than maybe we used to. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it's just showing where the responsibility is being pushed out to. And, and of course, then it all goes wrong. It's uh, it's out to the good advisors, the one that don't get involved with this, to pick up the bill with the FSCS levy. Brian, thank you so much. You squeeze a lot into your minute there. Much appreciated. Very good input indeed, sir. Thank you very much. Let's now go straight to Diane. Diane, please use your minute effectively off you go thank you uh well i found this a, a really enlightening um uh, session uh, i had no idea that there were so many holes in the whole idea of financial promotions I mean, we we don't get very involved in it apart from sending a newsletter to clients but the idea that authorized advisors would take a fee for an unauthorized product that they know nothing about uh, just so that the people can invest in it, I find absolutely horrifying. Um, and it seems to me that the FCA's uh, way that they look at this at the moment, well, they have more holes in it than a colander. I, I, I'm just staggered by the fact that there's so little control from the regulator for this to prevent it happening. Um, and of course, you know, where they prevent it, it we hear about it so many times where they, they know about something that's happened, but they haven't actually taken any action. In Cheltenham, we had um, a firm that was um, uh, putting people into dodgy pensions in some kind of property company. The FCA knew about it. They actually came to uh, and told them they shouldn't do any more of these things. They went on doing it and eventually the firm was wound up. But if you went onto the FCA register, um, they were still there. And the only way you could find that they'd done anything else is if you went down the register to find out whether there were any restrictions on what they could do. Now, what consumer is going to do that? Exactly. You know, so hopefully they have changed the register. So hopefully it'll be when somebody is actually struck off, they won't still appear on the register. But there seems to me um, an awful lot of... Um, room for improvement in the way that the FCA are there. I mean, they're, one of their main things is that they're there to protect the consumer. And at the moment, it's hard to see how they're actually achieving that goal. 
Diane, thank you for such a balanced but thoughtful and and passioned uh, set of comments. And I can hear in your voice very genuine sense of frustration that things are as bad as they are. Diane, thank you so much for being with us this evening. And I'm flattered by your kind comments that you found this session interesting. I, I, I certainly have. I've learned a great deal tonight. Thank you, Diane. We're, we're now going to go straight to Mason. Uh, Mason, over to you, sir. You've got a very different perspective, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to share with us. Thanks, Mason. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And I'm just going to focus on the banking perspective on this. Um, I was brought into JP Morgan's head of change role after they were fined 21 billion for various infractions in 2013. And, you know, there was mention of the US being a, a better regulator, um, but, you know, I'll just point Bernie Madoff as one of the biggest scams that the US has ever seen. Um, and if, from a banking perspective, you know, when banks are looking at these things, they're usually will point out towards, you know, unregulated financial services, creating a bad name. So they'll hide behind that, first of all. The second uh, justification they have is that over-regulation increases the cost of doing business. And then obviously the issue of course is that the regulator needs to be efficient in delivering their service of, of regulation. The third principle they hide behind is the smart consumer or the sophisticated investor. Unfortunately, you know, even sophisticated investors need protection from false claims. And so, you know, in my experience, what we found is that the culture is the biggest challenge when you're looking at organizations and institutions and, and that culture is not easily developed. It takes time to develop and you need education, you know, from school all the way into industry. You need leaders to be setting the tone for the industry. You know, there was talk about MPs, for example, setting those tone, but also leaders of, of institutions. And we're talking about uh, promotion, promoting those things that are good versus, you know, demoting things that are bad. I think, you know, unless there's an active culture of doing that within the financial services industry, that's not going to happen. And what's happened within the banking industry is that fines have become a cost of doing business, you yes. know, and it's, it's a simple equation of risk versus return. And the thing is that if the, if the risk, you know, justifies the return, then they're more than willing to do it. And in most instances, you know, when these things blow up, you find out that the people who are making these decisions were looking at the risk and saying, well, that's something that I can live with. And so um, when we're talking about within the indus uh, industry, you know, when the regulators do come in and we saw the regulators come in within the banking industry and, you know, have a quick look at all, you know, have like detailed look at all the processes uh, people, etc., and what they what they take comfort is in the armies of compliance officers that these firms have. Sometimes legal uh, people that they hold, and so the what they don't look into is the staff turnover, for example, power structures. You know, yeah. I, I have a very strong belief that compliance, for example, should be reporting directly to the board, just like auditors. Um, and then, you know, at at the end of the this, you know, unless as long as the FI industry remains a large portion of the economy you know, they will hold the reins of control in government and, and, you know, people in power. So, you know, what we need to see is more diversity in the economy. We need, need to see more financial education uh, from schools all the way to industry. And we need to see a building of culture of trust, you know, from the trust, uh, from the top for this, for this industry. Wonderfully put, sir. Thank you very much. And I think it was very appropriate that you reminded us all of the Bernie Madoff scandal. Let's not... Um, Let's not fall into the trap, perhaps, of thinking that everything's hunky-dory on the other side of the Atlantic. Thank you so much, Mason. That's brilliant input. Let's now go straight. I think our next is um, Armin. Armin, over to you, sir. Thank you. When something bad carries on happening for many years, it's always the case that it carries on happening because it's in the interests of the parties concerned. We have, on the industry side, an industry that makes money wants basically to be as unregulated as possible. And on the regulator's side, you've got people who A, want a quiet life, and secondly, see their main goal fundamentally as the health of the UK financial services industry and its profitability and its payment of taxes, rather than protecting the consumer. So it's a very challenging culture change task that we face and similarly you've got 
members of parliament and politicians, even more so in the USA than here, who are in many ways dependent upon you know, campaign contributions, et cetera, from the industry. So we shouldn't underestimate the challenge of producing a change to a situation where the FCA sees it as its role to put in the jackboot and where politicians want an FCA that bites rather than acts as a poodle sort of stroking the industry. Thank, Andy, you. You're on mute. Thank you very much indeed. I was on mute, you're right. And you were also very right with everything you just said. I completely agree with you. You're talking about the need to look at the underlying um the underlying drivers of behavior here you know what are the incentives that are causing the behavior to be the way it is and i think we need to have that very honest conversation about what's what are the dynamics here why is the why are the regulators being the way they are what needs to change them thank you very much indeed and our last just a minute round speaker is mr edward black who's with us for the very first time i hope you found tonight's session of some value edward thank please you. do share us share with us your thoughts thank you i did and um since you know i'm a financial services regulatory lawyer and i take compliance very seriously so you just saw me putting my uh, my watch um <laughs> next to my camera so that i could see what a minute looks like and you know there's so much to say i think what i need to do is to pick pick one theme um, and I think the theme that, that struck me, and it, it, it's great to have the opportunity to listen um, with nothing on my mind. And, and what strikes me is that we have um, a regulator of whom an enormous amount is expected, but the, the net result, um, which is, is stopping the FCA um, achieving the purposes that we all expect of it, is that it's, it, it's minutely resourced. It needs to be massively resourced in order to police both um, the regulated sector and the unregulated sector. And within the regulated sector, unlike the US, which I think is correctly held to be the gold standard uh, of regulation, Madoff was mentioned, but the fact is that Madoff did go to jail for a long time. In, in the U. In the US, you've got a securities regulator. Separately, you've got a futures regulator. Separately, you've got banking regulators. Over here, the, U the, the FCA is trying to regulate everything from consumer credit and mortgage through payment. Uh, it's, the UK, it's the listing authority. It's regulating everything with, without resources. It's massively under -lawyered. It can't be the enforcement um, channel for all of the things that it's seeking uh, to be the enforcement channel for. Um, and sadly, it's, it's already the third or fourth um, reiteration um, of a regulatory system. So, you know, what we do have with this um, consultation is an opportunity to rearrange some of the deck chairs, but I think it will be very helpful to nod towards the need for some quite fundamental um, thinking about resourcing uh, in order for the FCA to effectively um, be an investment protection regulator. And I think I've probably exceeded a minute um, and I hope I've avoided too much repetition and I hope I've avoided too much deviation. I think I repeated the word resource quite a lot but that was for emphasis, and I don't care how broke the rules in doing that. We, we won't punish you for that, Edward. We really won't punish you at all. The resource question is really interesting. There are some who are pretty damn sure that there is a lack of resource at the regulator. There are others who feel that the regulator simply is organised badly and doesn't make good use of its resource. Uh, but well, let's make sure that the question is... Being badly organised is just another way of being badly resourced. If you've got lots <laughs> of resources can't deploy those resources you may as well not have the darn resources well that's really interesting i get your point entirely wonderful it's uh, 10 past eight so i've mismanaged the time uh, it should be eight o'clock now so i've i've occupied 10 more minutes of your time than anticipated uh, at this point what we do is we're going to formally close the actual meeting itself but may i may i thank our speakers so so much i think they've been particularly good this evening particularly knowledgeable particularly insightful and particularly relevant to this whole topic of making sure that consumers are better protected from the many many 
shysters that are out there that want their money and don't care about breaking rules and laws to get it. So that's the formal part of the session over. We'll keep the channel open, as I said, until uh, half past eight. So if you need to go now, thank you, thank you, thank you for being part of part of the evening today. And if you want to carry on for informal light conversation, please do stay. Uh, so what we'll do is just uh, enjoy ourselves once more with that six year old time to wave and do this just to thank ourselves for participating and being here for the duration. It's been great to have you all. Thank you very much. And I'm going to go straight to Mark Bishop, who I know has got at least one thing he wants to say from the earlier part of the day today. Thank you. Over I, to would you. To I would love to stay, but in fact, I have to go and I look forward to meeting you guys again uh, at a future session. Great stuff, Edward. Thank you. Make sure you put your contact details into the chat, Edward, if you I have. have I have done that already. Yeah. Good, good on you. Cheers, Edward. Thank you. I Mr. Know, Mark Bishop, over to you, sir. Thank you. So firstly, thank you very much, Andy. Before too many people go, I just want to thank you for having organised this event. I think it's been brilliant. It's a pleasure. Uh, and secondly, uh, I want to pick up on a couple of things that people said. Uh, I think it was amazing said uh, something about uh, culture. Uh, and I have to say, I think that the FCA often says, oh, let's try and improve culture in the financial services industry. But uh, to which I kind of say, physician, heal thyself, um, because I, I find the culture of the FCA quite dysfunctional. Um, I mentioned how long I spent trying to get it to engage with the concept of change. Um, I think it believes that, you know, it owns most wisdom. There may be a small amount of wisdom in the Treasury or the industry, but there's certainly none amongst us peasants, the consumers and the people who are victims of scams. Um, and I think that that needs to change. I think needs to be a bit of humility, to put it bluntly. I think we actually know something more than they do. Um, and I think a little bit of diversity, by which I mean not people who tick identity boxes, but people who've had different life experiences would be very useful at the FCA. When I go there, whenever I go there, I'm 51, I'm usually the youngest person in the room, unless I'm dealing with board level people. I've sat in reception in the morning rush hour for a couple of hours. Almost everybody that walks through the door is below the age of 40. Almost everybody there is a graduate, usually from a Russell Group University or an equivalent from overseas. Um, most of them are law graduates or economics. So they, they're very subject to groupthink. And if they grow up in an environment in which uh, they may have worked in the industry, they may be thinking of working in the industry, many of their friends work in the industry, there is a kind of temptation, a perfectly not normal human temptation to, to kind of empathize with and identify with those people and be skeptical about these other people over here. So one of the things I would do is to kind of impose on them some level of diversity of thinking. So I'd hire people who, for example, you know, victims of scams. We know stuff about investigating scams, you know, insolvency practitioners who are genuine on the side of consumers. Some of those know about it, like Mark Hambling. Um, yep. you know, for example, accountants like Mark uh, Tabor. Um, I also think that they are very good detectives you know, who are good at this kind of thing, but people who have worked in the intelligence community who are fantastic at investigating things. People who work for HMRC who have unwound really complex multi-country VAT carousel fraud. They are very clever investigators. Uh, what these people all have in common culturally is a real desire to kick down doors and arrest bad guys so that little old ladies can sleep well in their beds. And, and I have never felt that sort of urgency when I've dealt with the FCA, if I'm honest. Thank you, Mark, very much indeed. I'm sure there are many on the session who would agree with you. Um, a point that sometimes gets made is the FCA seems quite defensive. You know, if people are trying to give constructive input feedback, the FCA seems quite defensive, almost unwilling to listen to um, criticism, taking it almost as if it's a slur. It's a great big, large, complicated organization. It can't possibly do everything perfectly. So perhaps one of its key improvables could be this culture, this need to be more absorbing of input from others who are who are on the outside. I, I, I agree with what Mark has just said, I, I really do. Thank you. Uh, would anybody else like to speak? Uh, who's, who's next? Mr. Tabor, just go for it, thank you. If everybody can, unmute, if everybody unmutes themselves, then we can speak more freely now. Thank you. Yeah, just on. something that, um, sorry, Mark Handling said earlier. I don't know if Mark's still here, but um, about um, the Dolphin financial promotions, and he picked up on a couple of points, which is quite interesting about you know what can be expected of approval. 
because two things came out. One he mentioned was 20 to 30% commissions being paid. And secondly, that the scheme was dependent on new funds coming in to service um, existing investments. And these are two things which come up nearly, you know, whether, whether you call it a skim or a scam, these come up time and time again. And I do think in terms of the financial promotions regime, this needs to be addressed because if you're approving a financial promotion, you need to have the capability to assess, is this business viable? And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out that if 20 to 30% of investors' money is going in commissions up front, yeah. and you're offering a return of 9 to 10%, and what you're doing is investing in property, you've got to ask, how are you going to, how are you going to pay your interest? How are you going to pay people back? And where's that cash going to come from? And I think a robust financial promotions regime with competent people do it looking at the financial promotions would be looking at whether this is a viable business or a business with no legitimate purpose, which is what a lot of them are in essence. Um, and, and, and I think this, this is a way, because there seems to be a sort of a fear amongst regulators and politicians to call something a fraud, because I suppose there's legal implications to that in terms of what you're doing. But, and that kind of holds them back in terms of dealing with stuff. And I think the you know, financial promotions regime can say, look, you, know, you can tell 99% this business is never gonna work. And I think that could come out at the vetting stage up front and would avoid a lot of the problems down the road if, if it was done properly. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. I, I think Francisco wanted to share a point as well. Well, I was just thinking that, um, I mean, this is going sideways a bit or, you know, different from what you're all saying. You're all talking about how we can sort things out through the legislative system. I'm just wondering whether we can have some system where on Facebook or on a, there's a website where you can report what you think might be a scam or something dubious. And mm. certainly in the last year, I mean, I, I heard somebody else say they'd collected, I think it was Mark in fact, who said they'd collected a lot, but I'm just picking, you know, I'm just seeing all these stupid financial investments. And because I've fallen victim to them, I can just tell that these are rubbish, you know, real rubbish. There are certain hallmarks that make you know this is rubbish. And I think it would be nice if we could say this company have done this, that company have done this, this company have done this. I mean, there was one by JP Morgan and I realized it was a scam and I reported it and it was reported as a scam. And three months later, I heard after having pushed it through action fraud and police and everything else, they didn't get the beasts. And yet it was a very sophisticated scam. And I saw it was a scam. I can now tell when something is not right. Mm. And I would love to be able to share that knowledge with innocent people mm. in an informal way. Yeah. Thanks, Francisca. I can just feel, I just sympathise with, uh, Alex, I see your hand. I, I sympathise with Mark Tabor, who's been, uh, was it 450 or so? He's, he's, he's finding these dodgy ads reporting them but not a lot seems to happen I know that must be very very frustrating um one quick point before I pass to Alex then to Mark Bishop um one of the pension scam victims we did an interview of this year it was bloody horrible to hear this the poor man basically a scammer had stolen his life savings okay I mean that in and of itself is horrific he then saw on um on the internet the same scammer putting a dodgy advert, right? So he went onto the internet and basically did like a blast for his social media contacts. Please be aware that XYZ is a scammer. Don't go anywhere near it. I alert you, warning, warning, warning. He then got a heavy, heavy duty lawyer's letters from the scammer saying what you've done is libelous or, or um, scam, whatever the word is, is libelous. We're now going to take you to court. Right. And they they try to get him to pay the scammer compensation for the oh, yeah. the scammer. The poor man didn't have any money to defend himself in court. So he had to just accept it. And he was heartbroken that this had happened. 
absolutely heartbreaking. Absolutely horrendous. It is. I it mean, is. there should be websites where you can report it. You know, like you've got this thing where you report good advice. I mean, the firm yeah. that I suffered from have got eight hundred good reviews. Gosh. And one bad, one medium bad review, which is from me. I mean, how disgusting is that? I mean, why can't we report this is not right? This is what stinks. You know, why can't we have a website or something which says, please check it? We have it for, um, you know, bugs on the computer. You can check. I've just had this bug. It's a bug. I can find that out straight away. Why can't we have this with financial promotions, which are iffy? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks, Francisca, so much. Thank you. Alex, to you, then to Mark Bishop. Um, yeah, I agree completely with the sentiment, um, Francesca. I would say I think that's pretty much what Mark Tabber has been doing with his Twitter account, is flagging up what he recognises yeah. as scams. Um, I would say as a journalist, what you find is that the UK libel regime is extremely fierce. And so, uh, for example, you can look at you know, cases where journalists have taken on big fraudsters and have still found themselves getting, like like Andy describes, lawyers' letters, a lot of grief, a lot of fighting, just because, um, and, and to be honest, I'm starting to think that there needs to be a lot more attention on the legal system in the UK and keeping lawyers honest, to be honest, <laughs> because <laughs> that's the kind of elephant in the room here is the abuse of the legal system uh, to kind of hound people to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. I think Mark wanted to, Mark, Mark Bishop wanted to speak. Thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you. I'd like to pick up on what Alex and Andy said and then go back to a couple of points made by Edward Black in the chat area. I think he's now gone. So um, that poor guy who ended up getting a letter telling him to cease and desist for having outed uh, a fraud, yeah. actually something very similar happened to me fairly early on in the Connaught scam. Uh, the funds were suspended in March of 2012. Uh, we only really knew there was a problem in the summer of that year, and a few of us started investigating. We didn't find satisfactory some of the things the regulator was saying, and we also found it rather unusual that the individual at the FSA, as it was in those days, that was charged with supervising a particular firm involved in the scam, uh, refused to meet with us or receive any evidence from us. Um, I then did a little bit of research on LinkedIn, and I found that she actually used to work with the compliance director of the firm that was being investigated. Um, and I actually heard a rumour on the grapevine that she may have been more than friends with that individual. Um, so I, I asked legitimate questions. I got no answers. And then the Connaught Action Group website uh, wrote a blog, absolutely positively not written by me, just in case there's any lawyers here, uh, which said, uh, which was headlined, poacher and gamekeeper getting familiar, question mark. <clears throat> Within two days of that appearing, uh, we had a libel letter from Carter Ruck, paid for by the FCA, um, demanding damages and an apology and that we would take down the entire website. Um, thankfully, we had anticipated that our website would end up in legal difficulties, albeit that we hadn't anticipated that it would be with the regulator. We thought it would be the perpetrators and those who covered it up within the industry. Um, so we had set up the website uh, with uh, via, it was owned by a US company, Freedom of Speech LLC, and it was hosted in a care home in Florida, God knows why, um, and its editor was a uh, no nonsense, New Jersey kind of New Yorker. Um, and so we just basically said, freedom of speech legislation applies in America. If you want to have a go, you know, you're welcome to. But in the meantime, if you can demonstrate that any of the things we said are untrue, you know, please do so. We will consider publishing your letter. And we heard no more, so they went away. Uh, so so that, that's the FCA actually trying to bully us for pointing out the flaws in the FCA. Um, that's the environment that we're living in. Uh, and to go back to what Edward Black said, he's gone now, but he made two comments in the chat. He basically said, we expect a lot of the FCA, but it has limited resources. I respectfully disagree. It has unlimited resources. Um, it sets the levy. The levy can be whatever it wants to be. If it decides it needs more staff, it will set a higher levy. Uh, now, I know the industry doesn't want to hire, pay a higher levy, um, and in the long run, you know, it shouldn't have to pay one, because actually I think we probably have got enough stuff, but it does mean that this isn't a legitimate defence, and the FCA often uses it. Um, and he also said, uh, last time we looked, the only financial services person on the board of the FCA uh, was the chief executive of which, well, it's the former chief executive of which, Richard Lloyd, uh, and in case people are not aware of it, I should probably mention some of the concerns about his appointment. 
Um, he went from there to, to chair an organization called Resolver, which basically deals with outsourced complaints. One of the parties that deals with outsourced complaints for is the financial ombudsman service. Um, and when the ombudsman service was criticized in the dispatches program based on whistleblower evidence about its many problems, the uh, Treasury Committee commissioned an external review into the, the FOS, uh, and it commissioned it from our friend Richard Lloyd, who accepted the mandate despite the obvious conflict of interest. Um, he basically uh, did a whitewash and said it was absolutely fine. Um, and then where did he go? Let me see. He became first a non-executive director and then the senior non-executive director of the FCA. He picked up uh, an OBE along the way. Um, so I would personally say he's, he's certainly not a consumer representative. I, I follow him on Twitter and periodically he tweets fawning comments about how good the FCA is. Um, absolutely shocking, including when a number of uh, victims of regulatory failure uh, were protesting outside the building and Bailey invited them in. I wonder why he did that. Could it be so that they weren't outside to be filmed? Um, but he invited them in and he said, hey, what other regulator would do this? Absolute bullshit. Um, so I personally think one of the areas that we need to fix with the FCA is the area of corporate governance. Now, if any of us applied, or someone like me, let's say a victim of financial services, income, if I applied to be a non-executive director of the FCA, I wouldn't even get an interview. I wouldn't even bother trying. It's such an unthinkable idea. But that needs to change. You know, the corporate governance needs to have in its structure not only the honest guys from the industry, but crucially, consumers, genuine consumers, not shills, basically people who join the, you know, financial services consumer panel, the people who are allowed by the FCA to join the body that's supposed to keep an eye on it, but people who genuinely have active consumers. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. I'm going to close the session with a short video, okay? A short video, which I think if you haven't seen this, you'll enjoy it. Um, it's Senator Elizabeth Warren, who was a presidential candidate. Um, she makes some points that are quite relevant to what we've been discussing uh, this evening. So let me just uh, tee this up, share screen. I hope you enjoy this and I'll, I'll include a, um, a link to it in the chat. So this is Senator Elizabeth Warren. Toasters could actually burn down houses. You know those little toaster ovens with the slide out trays? They didn't have automatic shut off switches. So you could pull out the tray, put four slices of bread on it, slide it in, flip it on, hear the baby cry, run down to the other end of the house, stay down there just a little longer than you thought. And when you came back, the flames would be leaping off the toast six to eight inches. Your toaster might be near your kitchen curtains, catch the curtains on fire, and then catch your kitchen cabinets on fire. Ask me how I know. Along came a federal agency, Consumer Product Safety Commission, and they said, enough, we're done. And that was it. The manufacturers put safety switches on them, so they click off after a couple of minutes. And there were no more toaster fires to burn down houses. By the early 2000s, mortgages, home mortgages in this country, had become so complex and so dangerous, they had a one in five chance of costing a family their home. Not through fire, but through foreclosure. Only this time, the federal government was not on the side of the people. It was deep in the pocket of the banks. And it told them to just keep selling those mortgages, raking those profits, prey on communities of color, prey on young families, prey on seniors, until they crashed the whole economy in 2008. So I had this idea. I had this idea that we could have an agency, like the booster agency. And this agency would basically say, hey, look, banks, you don't get to boost your profits by cheating people on mortgages, credit cards, payday loans, and student loans. So I go down to Washington and basically knock on doors. I go talk to anybody who will talk to me, Democrat, Republican, and make my pitch for this agency. As people listen to it, I'm getting the same two answers from almost everybody. First answer is... Actually, good idea. You can actually make a real difference, structural change. And second, don't even try. You'll be up against Wall Street, you'll be up against the big banks, you'll be up against all the Republicans, and shoot, you're going to be up against half the Democrats. You can't get it done. I get it. Big structural change is hard, but it was the right thing to do.
So we got in that fight. And we took on Wall Street, and we took on the big donors, and we took on the Republicans. And in 2010, President Barack Obama signed that agency into law. We won! Because here's the thing, you know what that little agency has done? They have forced the banks in this country to return more than 12 billion dollars directly to people they cheated. So what did I learn from this? Here's what I learned. I learned that even if the big money is against it, even if the big donors are against it, even if powerful people are against it, we need big ideas to solve the big problems in this country. There we go. Uh, by the way, <laughs> that wasn't... Um... That definitely wasn't a party political broadcast by Andy Agathangelo on behalf of the Democrats, but she does make a really valid point. You know, if it makes sense to regulate toasters, make sure they're fit for purpose and safe before they're allowed out in the market, surely, surely, surely we can do a better job of making sure that the products that consumers in the UK are exposed to from the financial services sector are safe and sound. And that has to start with making sure anybody promoting products is doing it in an honest ethical way that's why this consultation matters that's why we ran tonight's event and that's why i'm very grateful to all of you for being a part of what we're trying to do thank you very much indeed